this isn't the type of yard that people start at. The unit was SMI, seriously mentally ill, like the mental health yards. You know, there was other guys that had psychotic breaks and you would think like, is it that guy or is it the meds he's on? He has toilet paper, he rips it, rolls it up, seals right. the ends with toothpaste. Does that again, does that again, braids it. I could jump off a cliff with it and it would still support me. And the inmate says to me, so nonchalant, I'm like, Ellis, don't do that, bro. Right. Like, look, Ellis, please, like, just please don't. He's like, it wasn't that hard. I'm oh. Like, I'm like, well, it wasn't that hard. And he goes, all I did was I, 2011, I started working at this restaurant. I was doing that full time. And then I was working in the nightlife industry at night. So I answered this ad on Craigslist for this guy that had security contracts, all these different clubs all over Brooklyn and Queens and, and Manhattan and all that stuff. He gets the contract at this club in uh, Astoria, Queens. It was a strip club, but it was open seven days a week. I didn't realize the position I was in when I went to that club because I was so new to working in that type of nightlife industry. Right. So I'm looking around. I'm like, man, like, man, these guys are spending a lot of money. Like, they got all this expensive clothes on, jewelry, cars. Like I said, you got a Mercedes in New York with Oklahoma plates. It's so like, are you from Oklahoma? You drove here? I'm like, no, they're just rentals. Right. So the club is all criminals, right. you know? And I don't want to say criminal like in a derogatory way. It's not like these were, like a lot of them were nice guys. You know, just regular guys. It's just, you know, they played the hand they got dealt growing up in the projects or, or you know, in a much worse environment than I ever did. It's like, they're just playing the hand they got dealt. They, they're they following in their footsteps of their brothers, uncles, whatever it was. Right. So I realized I'm like, all right, this is a cash cow. This is like, I'm going to, I'm going to, this is, this is going to be my, my little, I'm going to stack as much money here as I can while I'm here. So at first it was just, like I said, it was Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And then it became like for five nights a week, six nights a week. What it would for like two and a half, maybe even three years. I remember I had one full day off and one half day. Other than that, I was, I was either at the restaurant or I was at the club. Well, you're, you're thinking you're making money just by what your hourly wage is or are these no. guys paying you to get no. in or. So I was making 200 a night, which for six hours of work, no taxes. I'm like, yeah. all right, that's, that's not bad. Yeah. You do this six nights a week, but this club was filled with hustlers. What I realized is these guys, like if you're a guy that's getting money, you know, the term, do a bunch of get money, whatever. They like spending cash because they think it gives them a sense of power over people, a sense right. of control over people. So you would have these guys showing up and let's say it was $50 to park your car in the parking lot. That's what, that's what the club charge. I'm like, all right, it's a hundred dollars to park. It's 50 for the club and 50 for me. And they're like, bro, hundred dollars to park. That ain't shit. It's like, I got it here. Take it. Because it gives them a sense of power over you. You're here to serve me. Right. So I was like, okay, that's one hustle. Right. And it wasn't even like just the 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 day to day stuff. It was the psychology of it that interests me. Like I said, I think going back to my stepmom was like that sparked my interest in just psychology in general. It's, there's just like the psychology of everything. We all know that. Um, I became close with the owner at the club. Right. He's. I still talk to him to this day. He's a good guy. He's. Um, I don't want to say a mentor, but you know, I was close to him. Right. So I could pretty much do whatever I wanted in that club. And what I told people, because I worked with a lot of guys, a lot of guys I worked with were, were incarcerated, right? Or a lot of guys are just these big black guys from the hood. Not that there's anything wrong with that, because there's not. It's just, <laughs> I'm, you know, I'm 6'4", to, right. 270, and it's like, I'm like, hey. who the fuck are you? Like, Jesus Christ. But I told these dudes, I said, look, this is not your typical, like, make your fucking money here, dude. Make your money. Let me give you an example of how this is going to happen. These dudes are going to come here liquored up, a group of five. All of them have been incarcerated, right? There's going to be that one asshole that's going to mouth off to you on the way out about something, something that you may have done or you may know, who the fuck knows? You may know the guy from somewhere. I said, this is what's going to happen. That guy's going to mouth off to you. He's going to say, you're a fucking broke this, that. You don't get no money. You don't get no pussy, da, da, da. I said, look, instead of just coming in guns blazing, trying to break people's fucking heads open, let them say that. Because this is exactly what's going to happen. This club is so popular, people want to come here. So 
one of the guys on a Raj is either going to take out some money and say, yo, my man fucked up. I'm sorry. We don't right. have no problems. He just came home. He was mixing the dark with the clear, the fucking whole shit. And then they're going to leave. And then next time they're going to come back, the guy's going to tell his boy, yo, you fucked up last time. Don't embarrass me. Go up and make it right with him. So I would tell guys, I said, make your money here. Everybody's going to have, there's enough money to go around. Jesus Christ, there's enough money to go around. Everybody has their own little side hustles, their own this, their own that. Make your money, build your little clientele, whatever you want to do, or people that you just know that do certain things in the world, and just let, let the money rake in. I had the luxury of working outside, so I would ID people, I would search people, I would you know, help park cars, whatever it was. It was kind of just like, okay, if you're the guy that works outside and you know everybody, we're not going to change this up, right? So right. I did that in the summer, I did that in the winter, all that shit. Just searching people constantly and everybody would come in, God damn, the motherfuckers searched me worse than right. when I was in Rikers or worse than TSA or worse than when I was up top. I'm like- well, What are you doing if you find, what are you looking for? Weapons? weapons we you know that shit. Dr- drugs no one cared about. It's just we, we made a, we made a little bit of a hustle out of that. So right. let's say you, you show up to the club, right? doesn't matter what you look like, you're getting searched. So I'm going to search you. If you got a, some weed in your pocket, I right, do whatever, not a big deal. But if you're dealing with guys that are used to hustling in the street, so they're not put, they don't want to get stopped and frisked by a cop. They're putting the shit under their nuts or they're putting it in the brim of their hat, whatever. Like when you do the same thing over and over, fucking, I can't tell you, hundreds of thousands of people I've searched. You get good at it. Plus, it doesn't, it's not hard to find weed when you stink of it from a mile away. It's like you probably got more on you. Right. So I search a guy. He has weed under his, under his nuts or in his ass cheek. Right. Okay. Give me the weed. Like, no, 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 I'm going to go put it back in the car. No, 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 time out. You fucked up. You can give me the weed. This, this is, we, we created this, me and my coworker. Like, you can give me the weed and go inside. Or you can keep it, but then you're not coming in. And there was only two ways this would play out. The guy would give it up and say, you're a piece of shit. And they would go inside and buy weed for somebody else or whatever. Or he would want to try to strong arm me and say, nah, fuck that. I was like, I right, build cars over there. I don't give a fuck if you don't. I can walk around all I want. You're the one that wants to be here. And the same thing, like I, like I said before, your friend's going to come outside looking for you. Right. Your friend's going to say, yo, what happened to my man? Like, what, what happened? Yo, talk to your boy. I didn't fuck up. He fucked up. And they tell me what happened. And then the other guy that was that guy buyer that was there was always there was always one guy in the group that was an asshole and always one guy that was like, bro, I don't want no heat on us. I just want to come and spend my money and fucking leave. Right. You're like, what what my man do? It's like, look, I told him his option. You can give me the weed and go inside. Like, those are the consequences of his actions. He got caught. You know? Because I can't I'm like, look, I've searched guys before and they've had razor blades. In their, in, in, their, in their backwoods. I find all types of shit. So like I said, I've had my hand cut open before searching people. It's like you're, you're dealing with people that don't function in the world the same way most of us do. All right. You're dealing with guys like, all right, we're, we're about that life. We're going to a club that caters to people that all live the same lifestyle. We have to do what we have to do. So it just came back to it's like, all right, I'm going to go inside. I'm going to take that weed that I took from you and sell it back to you. Big deal. It's, it's not like I... When I left at the end of every night, everything I had, I either just gave it away to people or just threw it out. Like, I don't smoke. I don't want anything to do with this shit. I don't be driving home, getting stopped with all this shit. But if that weed costs $50 on the street, like, I'll sell it back to you for like $200. It's like, what the fuck? Why I got to pay $200, bro? That bottle of Patron costs $30 at the store. You just spent $300. Right. Inside the club. We're not outside. We're inside the club. Cash is king, bro. You live that lifestyle, Right. You're just mad because you're getting hustled by the white guy. That's all. Like, just admit it. Right. Like I said, I was there six years. No, seven years, six nights a week. You were there six years? I was there from 2012 till I moved to Arizona, 2019. I had no reason to give it up. Right. I was making a lot of money, and, and I pissed away a lot of it, but I was having fun. You know, I went on a lot of vacations, did this, did that. Like, I went to Thailand. I went to South Korea. I went to a whole, Germany, a whole bunch of places, right? But that was just, like I said, that was the hustle I had. Like, or, or you guys come to the club, you don't have ID. I can't tell you how many people came to this club and they showed me their Rikers Island ID. <laughs> that expired two years ago. Right. Do you take it? I don't, I'll, I'll accept it. I'm like, all right, you know, you, you got something, something else that goes with that? Like, you think, anything, you think this is free? All right. What do you think? Also, a lot of guys probably thought I was a cop because I was wearing the pants. I... Let's be honest, I look like a fucking cop. You look like a cop. I look, I look like a fucking cop. So, 
um, I just had no reason to give it up. Like it got to the point where there were guys that were paying me to keep their baby mamas out. Right. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> They'd be like, yo, 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 you know, you know, such and such, right? Like, uh, hey, yo, look, here's my number. Text me if, she, if you see her pulling up, this is her car or text me if she's here or, or whatever. Just keep her out. Like, All right, dude, whatever you want. But you can't just, you can't, you got to be somebody that goes to the club and spends money because ultimately that's all the club cares about. Mm -hmm. Um, you would see the vicious cycle though, that came with that line of work. Right. So all these dancers are from Colombia, Dominican Republic, poverty, right? These are not girls that, you know, that study abroad. Right. So they think the only way that they can make money in the world is to solicit themselves, objectify themselves, whatever. What that came to be was these women would see, all right, these guys are spending a lot of money or this is a, this is a new group of guys here spending money or let's go try to get attention and maybe they'll like us for whatever it is. They're strippers, they're strip club. That's, right. what they're, that's what they're supposed to do. Um, but you would see the vicious cycle of, all right, now this guy's taking a liking to one specific girl doing what he does, coming in with her on her off night, or you see them on Instagram at other clubs. I'm like, all right, whatever. She gets pregnant. She's thinking, oh my God, everything's great. He told me he's, he's a, a finance exec. I'm like, in 2000, never is he going to be a finance exec. Right. Like, you know, delusion. A lot of girls figure it out. It's like, all right, you're just, you're a drug dealer. Big right. deal. So and they're not thinking long enough down the road to no, think, but, hey, he won't be a, semi-successful drug dealers for the rest of his life. And what'll happen is in two years from now, he'll go to jail for six years or five years and I'm stuck with a kid. Right. But at that point now, let's say a guy goes away and he's like, look, God forbid something happens. My man has a hundred thousand dollars for you. So that could be away for a year. I could be away for, for, whatever, for however long. Right. Yeah, that's a mistake. These women think yeah, well, it was a mistake, but these women think oh my God, a hundred thousand dollars. Like I'm rich. It's like, yeah, you may think that, but you also leased a C-class Mercedes because you started making money and you're paying $1,400 a month. Mm -hmm. You've never had a driver's license and you live in the Bronx and so your insurance is 900. Your overhead is eight grand a month. Where the fuck are you going to get money like this to afford this? You've moved your mom here from Dominican Republic. You moved your grandma here from Venezuela, wherever you're from. Oh, she's going to help us with the baby. We're going to stay home with the baby. And you, you, you know, you go do what you got to do. Just be a good dad. That lasts for so long. And then the guy's out saying, oh, I'm going to the gym, whatever he's doing. And then he's doing the same thing at the club again. And it's like, well, my baby mama, like, you need me for survival. I don't need you. All right. So I'm going to give you exactly what you need to pay bills. If the cable bill is $80, here's $85. Keep the change. Here's $200 for groceries. I want a receipt. I want to know what the fuck you bought. So that sucked. You see these girls are like, God damn, they don't even realize they went up a little bit and then just crashed even more. And then when that guy gets jammed up, goes to prison. Now what? Now you, you got that hundred thousand, you're going to burn through this. And then we got to go back on the stage. Right. You'd see girls God, showing up. Now you had a kid. Now it's, a, it's been five years. It's well, it's fun in the beginning when you're paying $30 for an Uber and then you're stacking all your money. But now when that money has to come in and go right back out, it's like, now you're just a typical American. I started realizing some other things about that club. I always worked outside, always, right? There were times I'd be inside, but for the most part, I was, always, I, like, I was the outside guy. Like, no, you know where everybody is, blah, blah, blah. Um, there was a point where I used to see this unmarked cop car show up all the time. He would just hang out in the front, hang out by the fire hydrant. I never said a word to the guy. A lot of the cops that came there were cool, but a lot of them was like, all right, you're not here for me. But I used to think, I'm like, what is this club doing that's so different from all these other clubs. Because you hear about these clubs getting shut down left and right. Like guys getting shot outside the club, all types of shit. Like what is this club doing that's so different? Because we have a higher volume of people. It's the same people that go to all these other clubs, but all these other clubs are getting screwed up. So the first time I realized like, all right, there's something a little, it appears they're doing something a little odd. So that cop that would hang out, I never spoke to him, right? He would just be there and one of the bus boys would come outside and give him a, a black plastic bag, which I'm pretty sure was not food from the kitchen. Right. Not my, I never said a word. It has nothing to do with me. 
right? This guy would come at like 1130 at night. No one shows up till two o'clock in the morning. That's why I used to love every year that make a big fiasco over New Year's Eve. I'm like, nobody gets here till two in the morning. Right. I'm just going to be here at midnight. <sighs> anyway, um, come to find out that that cop was uh, the narcotics detective of the year or some shit for Manhattan or NYPD, whatever it was. He gets caught in Florida buying 10 kilos of Coke or heroin from an undercover and then pleads out to four years federal time. So what I thought he was doing was either pulling people over outside of the club that I worked at and saying, okay, this happened outside of such and such club. Um, because the clubs, they, uh, it was all based on your liquor license. If every year you have to get a review of your liquor license, it's like, okay, we can renew it, but you have assault, assault, assault on a cop, uh, property, whatever it is. So that's all it was. They always wanted stuff to get written somewhere else. Like it happened in another club, another club, whatever it was. Um, I remember one day the, the cops came checking everybody's security licenses, which happened more than once. I didn't think a big thing of it. I was like, all right, here, take mine, you know, whatever. After I worked that night, I go home and about 10 o'clock in the morning, I check my phone and I have like 10 missed phone calls from my boss at the restaurant I worked at. Now, like I said, I was doing that during the day. I'm like, all right, this is, I'll do this. I have a job on the books. You know, I, I have free, pretty much free food. And, you know, I, I liked it there. I didn't have a, I, I needed both incomes. I didn't need it, but I was like, I had no, what am I going to do? Just work at night from midnight to 5 a.m.? All right. I call my boss, Chris. I'm like, Chris, today's Sunday, bro. Like, was I supposed to be in? He's like, dude, there's cops here looking for you. I'm thinking that it's cops that I used to work with because there was cops that worked there off to like moonlight, hang out, you know, whatever. A lot of guys that worked at Rikers Island, the Rikers Island was like a mile away from there. Um, I'm like, look, just give them food. I'll deal with it later. He's like, no, bro, they're here looking for you. I was like, all right, whatever. So roll out of bed, drive over there. Um, it's the same cops from the night before. I'm like what? And the guy, the guy walks up to me. He's like, Steven Tadaldi, we know you work here. I'm like, well, yeah, you know, I work here. You just, my boss just called me. For, of course, you know, I work here. You're showing up at my job. He's like, we know you work at the club. I'll leave the name out of it just because it's still open. And like I said, the owner was a good guy. He's good to me. They arrest me telling me that I have an open warrant from something that happened four years ago. And I'm like, that's impossible. I'll back up a little bit. When I was 18, my prom was on my 18th birthday. Right. Go to the city. We had no idea what we were doing. Drinking, probably one of the first ever times I was drunk. Couldn't hold my bladder. Get out in the middle of Times Square and piss in front of everybody. Get a citation for public urination. When I go home, I'm like, how am I going to tell my mom this? My mom was one of those, like, I want to rule with an iron fist. Um, so I just never told her about it. I just thought it was just going to go away. It's like, yeah, you just get a citation. It just disappears. Right. No one cares. It'll just go away. So... On my 21st birthday, I got in trouble again for, we were just late catching the subway. So I jumped the turnstile because the, the train was right there. Like, all right, whatever, we'll just jump it, we'll go. I didn't know that there was cops right around the corner. So they stopped me and they were going to let me go. It's like, dude, you got, you didn't tell me you had this bench warrant out from when you never paid the ticket when you were 18. So I'm like, fuck. He's like, look, no big deal. Look, I can't let you go. Now they were cool. They weren't being dicks. So they took me to, whatever, whatever you go. I don't even know what it's called. Central booking. I don't, I don't right. know what it was. Um, so I sat there for two, three days and I remember it was in a basement. And this is like to the day, like probably one of the reasons why to this day, I don't like overhead lights because you're sitting in that cell and there's a fucking light. It's just on yeah, and it's on and it never goes off. But I had never been exposed to any of this shit before. So I go see the judge. He's like, you're here for this. I'm like, yeah. She's like, time served. The two days was your punishment. Stay out of trouble for six months. If you get any, if you get caught up with anything in six months, instead of it just being a citation, because you're like, whatever this is called, you're going to go back to jail for it. I'm like, I don't get in trouble. That's fine. Like, I didn't care. So all this stuff happened years later. I was like 26 at the time. So this cop is like, you have an open warrant from when you were, um, drinking and, or not drinking and driving, uh, Urinating in public. Urinating in public. And then the thing with the turnstile, I'm like, no way, bro. I'm like, I have the police report in my apartment. I'll show you right now. Because at that time, I was trying to get hired by Rikers Island. Like I said, I majored in college in something that was good for nothing. Right. So when I got out, 
it didn't hit me until I started to get a little bit older. I'm like, all right, well, what am I going to do? Yeah, because I'm working you. with guys that are 45, 50, and I'm like, dude, I'm making more money than you, and I'm half your age. Like, I don't want to be this. And like I said, my mom was a nurse, and she worked her whole life. She worked her ass off. She had a legitimate career. It's like, you know, now she's retired, playing grandma, doing what she wants to do. And my dad never really had anything. It's like, I don't want to be that. I don't want to be with some woman that I'm obligated to be with because she has A and I have B and together we make C. Right. So I was like, all right, what can I do for a legitimate career? And this guy that I work with, he was like, bro, why don't you come work at Rikers Island with me? It's like, you're already doing, all these assholes are at Rikers Island. It's like, you're good at it. You know how to deal with people. Like I was never one of those guys. I'm not hot shit. I'm nobody. I don't want to get into fights and flex my throat. Dude, that's stupid. I don't want to go to work fighting people six nights a week. Right. Like, that's just not smart. Like, think logically about things. He's like, come work at Rikers Island. So like, all right. Like, I didn't have any family growing up that was cops or in law enforcement. Nobody. Do, do the cops take you down there? They take you down to Central Booking again? What do you mean? The cops said there, you have a warrant. Oh, right. Open. So what, that, okay. So yeah, sorry. Segue away from that. So I had the paperwork in my house that said like a minutes transcript or, or yeah. whatever it's called that said, this is what happened in, when you were 18. This is what happened when you're 21. Stay out of trouble for six months. And it goes away. And it goes away. I tried telling the cops that the cops, because when I, when I went to the, to, to the restaurant, I was in like the equivalent of pajamas because it was right down the street from where I lived. Right. I'm like, dude, I didn't even brush my teeth. I'm like, you, I don't know what's going on, but you, you got the, something is wrong. They're like, ah, that's okay. We'll follow you to your house so you can put clothes on. So I go inside. And remember, I told you they didn't have a doorknob. Yeah. I can only lock the door from the inside. I think these guys thought that I pulled a fast one and like took the doorknob off in a second or I had like some, uh, some fall safe system where I could just like weasel my way, whatever the fuck it was. I don't know. This was the first time I've ever been in this situation. So I was freaking out. So I locked the door and I'm telling the guy through the door. I said, look, dude, I don't have any weapons. This is ridiculous. Like I have this paper right here because I'm thinking, I'm like, all right, I'm just trying now to get hired at Rikers Island. I'm like, if I get anything jammed up, I'm fucked. Right. I'm thinking anything's going to screw me up. They put me in handcuffs. They put me in the back of the car. It was a Chrysler 200. Chrysler, like not a three, not a Chrysler Pacifica 200, whatever it was, some little sedan. I remember there was the two guys in the front and the guy and the guy in the back was sitting there on Tinder the whole time. I'm handcuffed behind my back. I'm like, I don't understand what's going on. They told me, like I said, that I have the open warrant, all this stuff. I'm like, you expect me to leave that you jerk off from new, from the city that were doing this at night came to long Island for this. I'm like, half these guys at work would have been in prison. Half of them were still on parole. What are you talking about? They told me they were taking me to the courthouse. They didn't take you home? No, I had gone, I went to the restaurant and I had gone home. Right. To change Did my clothes. Did you get your paperwork? You I said, got the paperwork. They didn't care. Okay. And I was like, all right, like I'm going to make this worse on myself if I try to fight this. Like, right, what, right. what am I going to do? And then my landlord's going to see, I'm like, oh God. It's like, all right, whatever. Like I'll come out. They put me in handcuffs, put me in the back of the car. And they said they were taking me to the courthouse. They took me to the precinct in Astoria, Queens, where they work, which is close to where the club is. The guy in the front seat turns around. And like I said, the guy next to me, he's like, oh, this is like the easiest overtime. I don't give a shit. Like, I don't care about any of this. Swipe it on Tinder, doing whatever. The guy turns around. He's like, look, we know you work, work at the club. And uh, he starts showing me pictures of that cop. And he's like, uh, they're trying to get you there. It's an excuse to grab you right. and everybody. He's got a warrant. We're taking him. Down. And I think they thought, okay, this fucking white guy from Long Island went to college. Like we'll be able to press him a lot easier than yeah. the other Neanderthals that work here. And yeah. I don't want to say that in a negative way. I talk to a lot of them still. And he shows me pictures of there over there. The cop is by the fire hydrant right here. I'm hanging out over here probably playing Angry Birds or whatever I'm doing. He's like, right. we show you all these. Like, you tell me every Tuesday night, you, I got Tuesday night for the past 10 years, not 10 years, but you're going to tell me you never spoke to him. Like, do you have any pictures of me speaking to this guy? All right. Never said a word to him. I find out a couple months later, I'm like, okay, he went down to Florida, got caught buying. Uh, right. The, dr the, the drugs that right. he was transporting, right? So he got jammed up. He wound up doing a couple years in the feds or whatever it was. But all that was to me, I was like, wow, what's this club up to? Or what are all these clubs up to? 
this is my first time ever being like introduced to this. I'm like, yes, all these guys in here are criminals and selling drugs and doing whatever they're do, scammers doing whatever they're doing, but that's not that big a deal. But like, how did this club and all these other clubs, how do they go about potentially buying off a cop or paying off somebody that's, that works for the liquor authority, whatever it was. That's what was interesting. Like I said, it's just the psychology of all this stuff. I was like, man, it was interesting. It was, it's one of those things. It's like, well, what were they trying to get you to, did they explain to you what's happening? They just asked you a bunch of questions. You said, I've never talked to the guy. I said, I don't. And I was, I was getting a little mad because they, they didn't have the AC on in the car. So fucking hot. I'm like, dude, I, I know all of us. It's not just me. That's hot. It's all of us. Are hot. First of all, you put me in handcuffs all the way from Long Island to here. That's not comfortable. Right. So you don't have a warrant. No. There's no fucking warrant. No. You just pick me up. You illegally. They thought that they could just jam me up because I'm probably the easiest one they could fuck with. I was trying to go find somebody. Well, his parole address says he lives here, but uh, what the hell? Like, yeah, yeah. You can, for somebody on probation, you can pretty much throw them in jail for anything. Right. But they don't really have anything on you. Except right. for they realize that at one point you got arrested twice. It was quashed. But at least it gives us an excuse to grab him. Right. And that was probably, like I said, the easiest one they could fuck right. with. Maybe we can scare him. I like, dude, show me a picture of me talking. Like, I literally never said a word to him. Right. Like, look, obviously you've been down. If you walk past somebody three Tuesdays in a row at the same time, you never say a word to each other. On the fourth time, you're, that's, that's the routine. Yeah. You just walk past each other. It's not an issue. That's how it doesn't look great that you're talking to some cop either in front of all these guys. So right. yeah, there's all kinds of incentives. But like I said, I didn't know a single, I was just doing my, I, I thought I'm like, I'm doing my own little hustles. I don't care what this club does. This is great for me. Right. Um, so they started taking me to the courthouse and then when they took me to the, the precinct first, they realized like this fucking guy doesn't know anything. Right. We just wasted all of our time and all his time. They take him to the courthouse, take him out of the car, take the handcuffs off, get in the car and I left. They're like, what do I do? There was nobody there. Right. It's like, what the fuck? I was like, all right, I guess I'll just go home. And I'm playing it over and over and over in my head. I'm like, what was that about? Well, what was the club doing? What do you think it was doing? The only thing I could think is I think that they were just giving the guy money to, like I said, if something happened outside of this club, because he was like the lead narcotics detective yeah. or whatever, write it outside of that club because yeah. that's our competition. We want them to close down. Right. That's the only thing I could think. Yeah, I, keep, I, help keep our liquor license clean. Right. So... I go back to work the next day. I, I told the owner what happened and he was just kind of like, all right, like whatever, go back outside, go to work. He gave me like a couple hundred dollars for the inconvenience. I go back, i go to work. But I was like, man, like what, what was so serious that they, they had to do all this or what were, who's, who's in charge of this, this, this Muppet crew over here that that's trying to figure this all out. Um, so I just go back to work. Right, go back to work. Like it never happened. I didn't tell anybody. It wasn't a big deal anyway. Because like I said, you're dealing with guys that have done real prison time. Right, guys with the whole buck fifty on their face, and they got this hyper aggression. What um? So what? How long did you work there after that? Five more years. Six Five more years. years. Yeah, I, like I didn't do anything wrong. Why did you end up leaving? I moved to Arizona. I mean, you, you just decided to move. I mean, it wasn't a reason. Like it was like you met a girl. No. You, so. When I applied for Rikers, and I know your fans, whoever watches, are like, man, you couldn't get hired at Rikers. You're a loser. Listen, I interviewed a guy from Rikers. What was his name? Haywood. Haywood. I read his book. He's great. He was great. Yeah, he's like, the, he's like, and, and, and I read that book, and I'm like, I get it, bro. You got baby mama drama. You got alimony, this, that, and that. There. It's like, yeah, you need that money. That yeah. check, you're losing a lot in taxes. You're doing all that overtime, and it goes away. He was funny, too, because he was, he was. I read his book like 10, not 10, like. Fuck, must have been eight, nine, yeah, like eight, nine years ago. You know, uh, Will Smith's production company optioned his story like three, like two or three times. And then because of the Will Smith uh, fiasco. The slap. Thing, yeah, the slap heard around the world. Um, because of that, they were like, listen, we're cutting back. Like, we're going to have, we can't, re we're not going to option it. We're not, we're never going to be able to do this project. So they didn't option it again. That's why he's kind of back out trying to, I think, pump up the book again. Because he thought he had something. He thought he had like, hey, Will Smith, you know, they're they're gonna do this. Like right. that would be a great This series. isn't like some independent, you know, right. film it's company. This is fucking deal. Will Smith. Right. Well, and and here's the thing, like that would have been a great series. Yeah. You know, because you could have done the whole because I've never seen anything like that. It's kind of like the dirty cop, but it's not he's like definitely, the guy Mike Dowd. Yeah, he's like in the yeah, but Mike Dowd is like it's a dirty cop, like it's Serpico or something. You know, it's a dirty he's in a dirty in a uh, dirty uh, you know, precinct, that sort of thing. Like that's you've seen those movies, but his would be a dirty cop in the prison, 
system, working with multiple different types of inmates and trying to dodge investigations into him. Plus, there's stuff going on on the outside. Plus, people are meeting him on the outside, giving him cell phones, giving him stuff to bring inside. Mm -hmm. How many times did the dog almost walk by and catch him? How many... You know, that could be a really, that could be an ongoing series and, and it'd be, it'd be different, you know, a little bit tweaked, a little bit different, yeah. but and, and tough, tough. Break. I, I tell people it's just um, like, I think a lot of people, a lot of like stay at home moms and housewives, they have a fascination with true crime and, mm. and prison. It's people because prison, they have fascination with prisons too. It's because people don't have access to prison. Like I can look up a whale and then go whale watching somewhere. I can look up Tanzania and go to Tanzania. You can't look up a prison and go to prison and see what it's either you're on my side or your side. Right. You know, it's like you, you can't just find out what it's about. So it's a vastly different environment. That, right. You know, it's so foreign and you can't imagine that. I guess also that this is happening in that building right down the street, that this is how people behave. And this is a completely mm -hmm. different society that's going on. It's a whole different world. But so the the so you never so you never got hired on at, at Rikers, right? So the guy that owned the club, he had opened another club in Brooklyn, and this was like another thing that was just fascinating to me. Um, that club had problems. I didn't want to work there to begin with because it was upstairs. So you got to deal with everybody outside, and then they have to go up a big ass flight of stairs and go around, and then go up do whatever they do. I'm like, how do you throw people out of here? Because we used to have to like drag people out, right? Um, Plus, you have a bad knee. You know, the knee wasn't really the problem. I never really thought about that. But yeah, thinking about it, yeah, I was like, I probably should have done all that stuff. But um, so the club in Brooklyn, I'm like, you would see the same guys I see at sorry. the club. Sorry, I was just thinking about something. So uh, I had a, a a business partner named D uh, Dave Walker. He was six foot six. And we were partners in a, in a um, he actually took over a mortgage company from me when I got in trouble. And he was six foot six. And at one point we were opening a second location and we were bringing boxes down and there was a staircase and the staircase, this place must've been built in the seventies or eighties. So it wasn't like it was 10 stair, 10 steps and then a platform. It was literally like 30 steps going yeah. straight down. Like if you fall down this, you're dead. You're dead. This was the old warehouse right. that I was in. And he was not in great, it was not in, he was in bad shape. He was extremely overweight. He had spinal pifida. Do you know what that is? Like you have a, a your spine is like, you have like a bad spine, right? Like it's actually, you're getting holes in your discs and stuff. Okay. Um, like he has back problems. He's on, he's, he's on oxys. He's doctor shopping. I mean, he's a mess. He also, he's a, he was a CPA. He has a master's degree in tax. Um, smart guy. But I mean, he, he, he had problems. We had a million dollar life insurance policy on him and on me. It's like those stairs are going to make me money somewhere. I remember we were walking down the stairs and I was behind him with a box. And at one point I kind of stumbled, right? Like a second stair, I like stumbled. And I, and I, and he's only, you know, cause he's so tall. He's literally, and I'm so short. He's, his head's like right here. And he was only a couple of a foot away from the box. Like hit him, if, hit him in the back of the head with that box. If I'd fallen over and pushed him even a little bit, he's going down. And so listen, the internal dialogue that I had in my head for those 30 steps was insane. Cause I was thinking, even if you fall and he survives, you tripped. You just almost tripped now. Like, I know there's no cameras here. I don't have that. There was no cameras. No cameras. It was yet. in the back and it was also in the back. Like nobody's around. And so when we got to the very end, he kind of, he's, he's like, who? He's already out of, out of, he's so out of shape. By the time we got down the 30 steps, because he's holding boxes too. He's out of breath going down He's out steps. of breath going down the stairs. Jesus. So he's like, <sighs> and, and he turns around and kind of looks at me and I go. I got it. I'll go up and get the next one. Oh no, I just looked at him. He goes, what? And I go, you just have no idea how lucky you are, bro. And he goes, what do you mean? And I said, I said, listen, I said, I almost, I stumbled. I told him what happened. I said, the whole way down. I said, you realize if I just pushed you, he goes, I'd never survive that. And I went, whew. I said, listen, it, I said, he, he goes, you went through a lot, huh? And he's, I said, oh, I was struggling. He was, plus we got that million dollar policy. I said, don't think I wasn't thinking about it. Like we were laughing and laughing back and forth. So I was thinking about you coming down the stairs. Yeah, you're we, five, six, right? We, me? No, I'm, I'm sorry, six, <laughs> sorry. About five, six. I'm sorry, you're, you're six foot five. Yeah. You're six, five. Yeah. Yeah. That's a smidge under that. But yeah, so when we're at that club, the one in Brooklyn, I'm like, all right, so what do we do? We're going to fight these guys in the room, take them to the elevator, take a break, go down, and then fight them on the way out. And then you just drag them out right there and whatever. And I was like, all right. But it was just the, 
I don't know what it was. Like you were dealing with the, the same fucking guy. Like I would literally see them one night at one club, one night at the next club. And the owner had told me like, look, I need you here. Busy nights in this club, busy nights in this club. I'm like, fuck, I don't want to have seven, six days straight of this crap. I want like my money nights, my, my downtime nights. Like I don't want it all gas, no breaks all the time. Um, but I started working there and I'm like, why are these guys that I just saw that are always cool acting like such fucking assholes now? And it's like, what? Cause you're in Brooklyn. You have to act like an asshole. You fools don't live in sunset park. It was, it was, it just made me think of like, you know, the names, like you think about prisons and like, uh, big Sandy has that name. And like, you go to big Sandy, you, you have to act like an asshole. You, you have to act like you're hot shit or a tough guy. And then I don't know, at Fort Dix or something. It's like, oh yeah, we'll fuck off there. Cause it's yeah, a, the, it's an the, easy yard. Bloody Beaumont or, yeah, right. they all have these, these names. Like, uh, yeah, I know what you're saying. Like guys are like, it's like, I know so many guys that had gone to Yazoo. In the low, but they were like, Yazoo is crazy. And I'm thinking to myself, I know, I know at least a hundred guys that have gone to Yazoo and then come back or went to Yazoo. And when they went to Yazoo, they were perfectly, they were docile here, but they go there they and up. they act up. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I, I know what you're saying. I don't know what it is, if it's the environment or just that it's that it's the environment of that prison that allows you, or it's something you can get away with or it's expected. And, and this will tie in a little bit more. Um, we, I was going to say, you know what happens in prison too? Guys would come from another prison and they'd be telling you about, man, at other, other prison, the, we would never let this happen. And this and this. But you're in a group of guys of 20. Your little clique is made up of 10 or 20 guys. And you're sitting there going, yeah, but we don't, we're, we're not, we're not fucking. Like you, you, you want to act like that? You can act like that. Go they'll back. grab you. They'll throw they'll you in the shoe. Back. They'll ship you back there or they'll ship you to the medium. You can act like that in the medium all day long. But sorry, we're not doing that. Like we're not r- running around smashing all the chos. Right. I'm not doing it. And so they would they bitch and moan, but then before you know it, they were docile, just like everybody else. It's like okay, well that doesn't that's not how it works here. And it it was just shocking to me. And, and, and like I said, like down when we talk about prison down the road, my experience is like it, it ties in. Um, so, so the club, yeah. yeah. So the club, this club was a fucking disaster, dude. It was, it was fights, and I was like, these guys are just—they could literally kill each other one night, and then the next night they'll be at the other club in Queens, and they're fine. The only issue I ever had there, which it really wasn't that big a deal, because it wasn't so much what the guy did; it was like the back end of it. So, I searched this guy one time. Um, part of the rule was like, look, if I if I find something on you, weed's one thing, dude. That's basically just a commodity. I'm just gonna sell it back to you. If I find something on you, take everything out right because if i search you again and i find anything else now it's your you're gone go jump on a lake i don't care right. you're not coming in and that, that that would like infuriate me it's like dude you're already caught bro just give it up like this isn't this isn't i'm not the feds running down on you like just give it all up long story short i searched this guy he took out one thing and then another thing i'm like dude just go i can't deal with you go home right his friend comes back a little later it's like yo he just came home this is this is the night before thanksgiving so that's a Big night for people to want to go out. Uh, I'm like, look, dude, whatever. I never had a problem with you. You're on a rush. I get it. Your boy just came home. I don't know him. I'll let him in. I'm going to search him again. Tell him I'm going to violate him. Worse than I have the first four times because I don't know him. And I'm like, you know, look, this is what it is. I know I'm the white guy from Long Island, but I do this shit every night. Search him again. He goes upstairs. Cool. That's the end of it. Like two hours later, I hear screaming on the radio. There's a fight or something. So when you go in this club, when you go up the stairs, there's a... A lot. They had like a, not a kitchen, but they had like people that were catered food and they put in like the sternos and all that shit. And then you would, there's co check there. And then the, the room, the, the room to the club was over there. So it's that guy's entourage that's fighting, right? So the guy that I had the problem with, he sees me and <laughs> it's like these guys, they talk about how tough they are, breaking necks and throwing haymakers. And the guy took the pan with the rice and he threw it at me. That's your thing. You're throwing the water at me. Right. But then he took the pan with the water. Now, if you know, the little sternos underneath, yeah. that's just boiling water so that steam keeps the food hot. He took that and he launched it at me. I used to have the video on my phone, but I, I go like this to just block it. And I had a, I had a hoodie and an Under Armour on because um, it was cold. It was the night, like I said, night before Thanksgiving. So I, don't, I never knew what started that whole thing, but drag the guy out. We go, like I said, we go down the elevator. We play that eleva- elevator music on the way down and then just picks back up when we get outside. I don't know. Drag all the guys out and the uh, cops wound up arresting the guy that, I guess the one that threw the water at me or he was in part of that entourage, whatever it was, but a couple of them got arrested. Now they get to spend Thanksgiving in, in jail. Yeah, probably the 40th time in their life. Right. But um, 
my adrenaline was so high and it was cold. And I was like, all right, you know, whatever it is, what it is. Like I was, I was never one of those after something happened, I was like high five and dudes. I'm like, dude, that, I didn't want that to happen. Bro. Right. I don't enjoy coming here. Like use, I was just going to sound pathetic, but like just use your fucking words to get out of this shit. Right. You can talk anybody out of anything. Like I've done it in prison. You talk people that are trying to kill themselves. Right. I started noticing afterwards. I was like, yo, my arm is fucking hurting. So I, I, pull the hoodie off, and like I said, I had an Under Armour on underneath. I can show you guys the pictures after how gnarly it was, but I peeled the Under Armour back and the whole layer of skin just peeled off my arm because he threw the boiling water right. at me and I blocked it like this. And I'm like, yo, thank God it didn't hit me in the face. Yeah. So the cops had seen that and they're like, wait a minute. So they're like, okay, now we can charge a guy with assault or whatever it was. Right. I'm like, I don't, I'm not present. I don't want to do any of that shit. I don't care. Um, they called uh, 911 to come look at the burn. I was like, I really don't want to do this, but whatever. They're like, look, we can take you to the burn center. I'm like, dude, I want to go home. It's Thanksgiving day. Just give me some burn cream or some tattoo cream, whatever. It's not that big a deal. So I go home. That was the end of it. A year later, I keep getting a call from an unknown number. So I'm thinking it's Rikers Island people call me. I'll get, I'll get back. I'll circle back to that in a second. But it was the Brooklyn DA's office. And they're like, is this Steven Tadali? I'm like, yeah, who the fuck is, who's this? And he starts telling me my name's such and such. I'm an ADA with the Southern District or whatever the terminology is. He's like, do you know uh, some name? I'm like, what? Who are you talking about? I don't know what you're talking about. Like, do you remember what happened on Thanksgiving last year? And I'm like, no. Because I forgot about it because it really wasn't, it was like, all right, whatever, it happened. It's, it was basically like a, a just a little, a, a minor burn just on my whole arm. Right. The guy's telling me, he's like, look, we want to prosecute this guy. We want to charge him. We want to let him know that he can't do stuff like that. I'm like, dude, this guy's been down like what? Three, four times? You're not going to get your message through by charging him with this. He's going to get what? Two days in Rikers? He's probably already down for something else anyway. They'll just give a time serve for that. Right. I'm like, I don't care about this. It's over with. It happened. You know, it, it is what it is. So... The, the the guy tries to entice me. He's like, look, we'll give you a parking pass and we'll give you a voucher for lunch. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I was like, Jesus, bro, you're my, my, I could be sleeping right now, but you want me to come in at, at nine in the morning in Brooklyn. All right. I'm like, you know how long it's going to take for me to get to downtown Brooklyn? Are you smoking? What's wrong with you? I'm like, I'll pass. I'm like, how much is the, the, the voucher? He's like, it's for lunch. It's $6. $6. What am I supposed get to get? a hot dog for $6. Yeah, a hot dog. Yeah. <laughs> And I was supposed to give it to some, some food truck guy. He's like, what, what? No, I want cash. What is this shit? I don't want to claim this and I don't, whatever. So I was like, I'm good, dude. I, I, like I said, I don't care. It happened. It's over with. This is the, I kind of signed up for this. All right. You know, I chose to work. It's like, look, my sister's a teacher. She didn't sign up for her school getting shot up. She signed right. up for the little badass kids. All right. He calls me again. He calls me again. He calls me. I'm like, bro, what's going on with you right now? And I'm realizing, like, dude, you just want to jam this guy up, get a conviction under your belt because you're. So I finally, I finally wind up going in. He's like, we want to convict this guy. I'm like, dude, how long you been out of law school? It was like three years. I'm like, okay, so this you're just you're doing your ADA stuff. You're paying your dues. You're doing the job that nobody wants, so that you can promote and make yourself look and look at how much you could present. Look at boss, I have a 97% conviction rate. Look at all these things that I've done. Like, don't let your ego get involved in the way of your own job, my man. Like, this, this, that's all you're doing. You just want an easy conviction to make yourself look. I said, I'm the victim. I don't fucking care about this guy. Right. It's over with. I don't even know what he looks like. So I said, look, this is the last time I'm coming here. Don't call me again. Never heard from him again. But I was just like, man, these guys just want to convict. Convict, convict. And I'm like, what happens if this was like something serious? It's like... You have the weight of the government on your side against Joe Schmo, who has nobody helping him. Just another funny story about the club, like the type of things you see that just become normalized. There was this one bartender, like the bartender became the main attraction at this club, right? Just, I don't know why, whatever it was. But there was this time that one of the bartenders, it was her birthday. And she was like in a lot of rap videos and she has like a name for herself in that industry. So a lot of people came out for her. So her daughter shows up. And the daughter brings her little scammer boyfriend. So I was like, first of all, I'm not a father, but I wouldn't want my daughter with a fucking hustler, right? right? So they come in, and I remember looking at this, like this is one of the dumbest things I've ever seen in my life. So mind you, it's a strip club. Everybody gets their $1,000, their brick of 1000 or 10000 whatever they get. I've seen a lot of money go through that place. Um, 
And I remember looking at this and she's on the bartenders on stage twerking for her birthday thing. The <laughs> daughter's boyfriend goes on stage to throw money at his girlfriend's mom. And I'm looking around like, am I the only asshole here who thinks this isn't normal? Or is this, am, I, am I the asshole for thinking this isn't normal? I'm like you're throwing money at your girlfriend's mom. But anyway, just like that's like the type, it's like you see stuff in prison. It's like, okay, this is just normal because of where I am, but this wouldn't fly in the real world. Right. Like people taking electric cords and boiling water, boiling water with it, making it a stinger. It's like, okay. It's not a normal thing, but not a normal it thing. does work. Right. So, <laughs> so back to, uh, so that whole DA thing, like the, with the thing on my arm, I was just like, man, you people are just, you just want to jam people up. Like you don't care what this guy's up. Not that I care either what his yeah. upbringing was, but it's just like, man, what if that was me? Because like I said, I grew up with, there's the haves and the have nots. And I was like kind of in the middle and I was like, man, it doesn't take a lot to be a have not. Mm -hmm. It doesn't take a lot to just be, get yourself jammed up in something. Like I was telling, I was telling Bozier before, like, would you rather be guilty and now would you rather be rich and guilty or poor and innocent? You know, it's like, you don't, if you don't have a lot, like you're screwed. You can't go yeah, against the government. Say, rich and guilty. You still got a chance. Poor and innocent. You're, you're, you're meatloaf. Yeah. Um, so, so what, what happened with Rikers? Right, Why didn't right, right. you? So I go through, it's, it's not really that sensational of a story, but I go through the whole Rikers thing. Like I said, the guys that were working at the club with me, a lot of them worked at Rikers. I'm like, bro, you do this shit every day. Like it's the same people. They just wear jail clothes. Right. It's the same people. No change, no, you know, whatever. It's like, you'd be good over there, bro. Like do 20 years, get a pension, call it quits, move to Florida, whatever. I, I used to start hearing a lot of people talking about like, you know, when I get older and I retire, like people that are like your, like your age, like older than me or whatever. They're like, you know, when I get to that age, when my son graduates college or when I pay off my mortgage, when my pension kicks in, I'm moving to North Carolina, I'm moving to South Carolina, somewhere where my money stretches for like, fuck New York, I'm leaving New York. And I was like, I'll keep that in the back of my mind. So Rikers Island, I go through the whole process and they, this was in 2015, maybe even 2016. So I got a call, I started the whole process um, went through the whole thing and then I was kind of playing the waiting game. I got screwed up because I pled guilty to three speeding tickets in, I, I think it was a year. I, I had a, a GTI at the time. So I was like dicking around driving fast. And when you're on the, the Bell Parkway going to, from Long Island to Brooklyn, there's once you get deep into Brooklyn, it's just nothing but like motorcycle cops and, and highway guys. It's like, if they pull you over, you're done. So I got three speeding tickets in one year and my license gets revoked, not suspended, revoked. So I, I can't drive for six months. So at that same exact time, I was going through it at Rikers Island and they said, no, we can't hire you. You don't have a license. So I got disqualified. All right. And I remember thinking like, fuck man, like I was banking on that. Like yeah. it wasn't like I was banking on it, but it was so right there in front of me. And I was like, I know I'd be good at it. And you know, whatever. So that's like 2016. So I put it aside. I just keep working at the club, keep doing what I'm doing. And then I had a friend that was a DJ at the club and he winds up becoming a cop in Arizona. And he's like, look, why don't you just try to become a CEO out here? And like him and I are similar. Like he's, he's still friends to this day. Um, do you end up getting your license back? By yeah, yeah, yeah. It just got revoked. And then I had to wait six months yeah. and get it back. Um, but I thought you just go to the DMV and just say, I did my six months, get my license back. But I had to like submit paperwork and had to go up to Albany and it took another four months to get it reinstated. All right. I was still driving every day. I was just, you know, driving like grandma Rabinowitz, not trying to get pulled over. All right. So that screwed me from Rikers because like, as you know, like if you got to go out on a transport, some CO has to take you, they have to have a valid driver's license. So I got it, whatever. So I wait and then I'm just working at the club, just doing whatever. And um, fast forward to end of 2018, like I said, I was working at the club that entire time. <laughs> Another sidebar. So across the street from this club is a, um, you know what halal carts are? Halal? Like food, halal carts. You know what that is? Halal carts? Like food, they're just food carts. Food trucks. Yeah. But food truck was, or food car? Oh, the little cart? No, they were trucks, but they're just called halal carts. But um, it was like the food truck where you get like like gyros and all that yeah, stuff. Yeah. So across the street from the club was a poultry place where they made all of the stuff for the carts. Okay. So when the sanitation guys would come around, um, 
in the winter it wasn't bad, but in the summer they would put the little fork things in, they would flip the dumpster over, and a lot of times they would miss. So in the summertime there'd be rotten chicken guts and lamb guts and all this horrid stuff, and it would stink. Like you're you're picture going to a club, you're liquored up, or maybe you just finished eating, and then you go to this club and it smells like rotten corpses. All right. Um, that was just funny. You would see people walk up and it would just like hit this like zone of like where the stench comes and just vomit everywhere. Um, we realized we could open the fire extinguisher outside or the fire hydrant and it would just blow, blow everything away. But it's just funny. It's like, that's right across the street from this club. Right. Like night and day, like during the day, it's an auto body place in a chicken slaughterhouse. And then at night it's this club. But so fast forward to the end of 2018, I go to Amsterdam with my friend Ed, who worked at the club, he's kind of like my boss. Um, that's my boy right there. He's, he's a good dude. So we go to Amsterdam, and then when I came back, I took my other friends off. I was like, you know, let me just go out to Arizona and try the the, 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 the I'll take the CO test. Whatever. What do I have to lose? Because I, I had tried again for Rikers. I just had to wait a little bit. So because um, I had to wait for the stuff to fall off my driving record. So. Right. It got to the point in 2019, because I think in 2019 I turned 30. So I was like, man, I gotta just switch something up. I gotta, I gotta make a move. I don't wanna be doing the same shit I am right. when I'm older. It's like, this has a shelf life, this job. It's like being a stripper, it has a shelf life. Like, you're not supposed to be doing this when you're 50 years old. All right. Um, so I go out to Arizona, I take the test. And I remember thinking, like, this probably isn't good. They, I was hired in like two weeks. <laughs> but meanwhile, the Rikers thing was like six months. Right. But that one, I was like, all right, it's just different out there. Like the paperwork was a lot less and I had nothing to worry about. Like I didn't have any criminal issues. Like I said, that thing with the, the cop from before, like that was them just trying to screw me. I didn't do anything wrong. Right. So I moved out to Arizona. So I got into Amsterdam New Year's Eve 2018 to 2019, come back, take the test. And by March of 2019, I was living in Arizona. So it was like a quick process. Um. I didn't really say goodbye to a lot of my friends. I just like, I'm not one of those. Like, I don't like attention on me. I just say goodbye to my family, got up and left. Um, drove there, took everything I could fit in my truck, drove out there. It took me two days. Um, I assigned, I chose to work in the Phoenix prison. And the only reason why I chose Phoenix specifically is because mind you, I'm from right outside New York city i never been to, I never even been to Arizona. I can't live in just some random place in Arizona where there's a prison like Safford, Arizona or Winslow, like these small little like prison. Towns, I can't right. do that. You know, it's like, I got to live where there's people. I'm used to being where there's people and right. stuff going on. So I chose Phoenix because I've heard of Phoenix. I didn't know what type of yard it was. Right. So I go out there and the Academy was two months. Maybe I'm like two months. I'm like, this is a joke. And I'm thinking, I'm like, none of this shit these people are telling us is going to matter. Right. None of it. Like none of it at all. And then halfway through, you had to go work at your unit for a couple of days doing like training or whatever. And I didn't know that it was an intake yard. Like I said, I chose Phoenix because I wanted to be in civilization. Right. It's like Phoenix, there's four major sports teams in Arizona. Like, cool. It's, you know, there's a lot going on, which there is. Um, but I didn't know what type of yard it was. So I go there. Do the academy, start my OJT, and Phoenix Yard is on eight-hour days. I had the miracle of starting on day shift, which is like nobody starts on day shift. And everybody would think you would want to go to swings. You don't have kids. You're a young guy. You're you're in a town. Like you probably want to go party. Like I don't like those swing shift hours. So I started on days. Um, it was kind of depressing. Because so any, any county in Arizona, when you go to court, you go to prison, they take you from county to the Phoenix yard. That's where you get processed. And then you get sent to all the other prisons in Arizona. I was like, damn, Monday through Friday, these buses show up from Maricopa, Coconina, Yavapai, Pima, whatever, all the county. Like, there's that many people going to prison. It's Monday through Friday. These people are just coming in, coming out. How many people a day come in? Maybe there's be days where it's like 40. There's be days like 200. But it's like every fucking day, bro, Monday through Friday. Wow. Yeah, and I'm like, where's the crime at? Like, where's, where's all this crime at? I don't see all this shit going on. You know, even even when I'm back at the club, I remember thinking like, all these guys sell drugs. Like, where's the party at where there's all these drug all these drug users? Because right. these guys make a lot of money. Like, where's the party? 
But anyway, so the club, uh, not the club, the, the unit was intake. And then on the other side was SMI, seriously mentally ill, like the mental health yards. Okay. That's why I said, I don't know if in the feds, if it's SMI or EDP, emotionally disturbed person. I don't know. I'm not sure. But it was like the, the mental health yard. So you would go to work, you would get assigned a post. Um, the guys on the intake side, they would just be there and then they would roll up and go to their yard. It could be a day later, a week later, a month later, whatever it is. The other guys on the other side, they like lived there. They were like, that was like their assigned housing unit. Like they were there for the mental health program. Behind that was like right around, the, it was kind of right around the block. There was a low functioning, it was a low custody SMI yard, but it, it was dorms. It wasn't cells. You know, you could be out from sun up to sundown, which there was a lot of guys there that were crazy. And there was a lot of guys there that were just hideouts. Right. You could tell a lot of these guys are hideouts. Yeah. They're just working the system. And they had that like narcissism about them. Like I got over on them. Look yeah. at where I'm at. I should be at Ras yeah. Max or something right now. Yeah, they didn't want to go to a normal prison. Right. See that they're kind of hiding out by saying they have mental health issues. They know how to play the game. There's only so there's only so many things that you can accomplish by being like a mental health inmate in prison. It's like they could put you on watch, give you a shot of Thorazine, put you on all these meds, put you at a different yard. And plus it's in Phoenix, so it was centrally located for a lot of people. Um I started to get the the vibe of like this isn't it. Like, this is what I signed up for. Like I said, cause on the intake side, there's no store, there's no politics. Like they'll be there, they get shipped out. And what a lot of people had told me was they're like, this isn't the type of yard that people start at. A lot of, like a lot of guys that have been doing it for a while, like you never even used to be able to start here. They just changed that recently because we're so short staffed everywhere. Right. So a lot of guys were like, yeah, I started at Florence. I started at Lewis. Like Florence was the first prison in Arizona in like the 19 early 1900s. It was built by inmates. Um, so I started to get this feeling of like, I don't really deserve this to be here. Like, I feel like I had to like go pay my dues somewhere else kind of. And something else had happened. I'm not the biggest fan of like, okay, me and you are coworkers. Like I'll, I'll respect, be respectful of whatever you want and we'll, we'll chop it up. Work. Like we're not friends. Right. You go home to your life. I go home yeah. to my life. You're a work friend. Yeah, right. We're not like hanging out. You 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 put people. You give people the same training. You put them in the same uniform. You put them in the same environment for the same common ground. Like we're not fucking friends, bro. Like we're just not. So a lot of people would, you know, be friends with people. Like a lot of guys on swing shift, they would hang out with each other. There was always somebody trying to get some doc pussy, which I just never understood. I never understood that, but whatever. When you stay for overtime, like a lot of a lot of the other units, you can show up whenever you want and just work as many hours as you want. Right. But when you stay at that unit, you had to stay the full eight hours. So you're doing a 16. So I would do 6 a.m. till 10 at night. I would see a lot of people, like when you stay for overtime, you get to pick your posts. So they're like, all right, I want to go to Ida or Ida Back Pocket or whatever it was. You could you can pick your post, which was they give you that luxury. I would see a lot of people that were talking about like yeah, let's go out tonight. Let's do this. Let's do this or, you know, whatever. And I'm thinking like, if me and you were working together and you and I are going out partying, doing drugs, when we go back to work, you're going to get paranoid if I'm telling other people what we're doing. I'm going to get paranoid if you're telling everybody else what we're doing. Right. Like, you know, everybody's business. Like I guarantee every inmate at Coleman knew every officer's business. Right. Meanwhile, they never spoke to them a day in their life. I started thinking like, you guys are I can't tell you what to do. Like, I can't tell you to hang out with, but you're going out and doing stuff and you're just partying. You're not doing anything bad. But then you're like putting on Snapchat and the ADW is friends with you on Snapchat. The right. captain is friends with you on Snapchat or on Facebook. And it's like, wait, he just called out today. Why do I see him, you know, on Cinco de Mayo with uh, drinks in his hand, you know, whatever it is. That didn't sit well with me because I knew what was going to happen. I'm like, and at the time I'm like, look, I moved all the way across country for this. Like I said, I wanted out of New York. I was like, I had a good run at the club. New York's going to be there if I want to go back. So people started getting, I, I hate to even say this, people started getting walked off because they were refusing to take UAs. Now, mind you, you have to take a UA when you start this job. And unless there's a really specific reason, they're not just going to randomly UA you if you come to work every day, do your job. So I'm like, look at you fucking, look at you people. You're, you're hanging out. You're, you're, you think these people are your friends. 
you're partying, you're telling everybody your business, then you go back to work, you start getting snitched on, now you have to take a UA, you fail it, now you get fired. Right. I, like, I don't want any parts of that. Like I said, on the other side was the mental health stuff. So the Phoenix Yard, it's just like a big rectangle. There's two intake parts, and part of it was um, a mental health yard. And you would, like those guys were housed there. So you would go there and you would see like, that's where like all the banging and shit eating and the real jail stuff. That's where you would see it. But it still had that ambiance of like, it wasn't like, cause they had, they had like murals where there's like butterflies and shit painted on the wall. It's like, how's that going to help? But <laughs> you would, that was just going to help. Some guy threw a, a butterfly with one wing and you, 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 you think he's rehabil- rehabilitated, but you would see things there. That was like an introduction. Like, all right, these guys aren't just here for a week and then they get shipped out. These guys are like, here and you would see these guys like with these uh i don't know in the feds like in arizona if you go to prison like there's inmate one then two then three the numbers are ascending right so if you went to prison in 2000 with and your number was one five zero two hundred and you go to prison anytime you go to prison again you're still going to have that number one five zero two hundred yeah so if you see a guy with an old number he might have been down since he got that number or he could have been in and out his whole life or he could have gotten it 30 years ago and then came back to prison 30 years later yeah so you would see guys with like, I think right now they're probably up to like three eight, so like three hundred eighty thousand, maybe three seven. You would see guys with like zero four numbers. I'm doing the math. I'm like, when you go to prison, like seventy eight, right? Like you've been down this whole time, and they're like, yeah. It's like what? Like it doesn't compute in my head. Like guys tell you like, I've never had Pizza Hut. Yeah. I haven't pet a dog in thirty years. It's like yeah, you, never you seen, don't never seen an iPhone. Never seen an iPhone. Never driven a car. It's like oh god. But at the mental health side, you would start seeing a lot of like things, you know, things that happen in mental health. Like I said, I think part of the reason why I like that was because of my stepmom and all her crazy ass issues. Right. Not that I wanted to fix anybody, but it was just interesting to me. So you would see guys eating their own feces. Right. Right. Um, Like this one guy we were talking about before, he would eat his own feces he would take the little shamrock milk cartons, I'm sure you remember them, make flowers out of them. Right. Plant them in the feces. Like now, they're, this is, like this they're, is a true story, right? Bro. Like they're going to grow? Like they're going to, and water them with his urine. The guy would lay on the ground and rear his legs back and piss in his mouth, all types mm. of shit. And you would think like, is it that guy or is it the meds he's on? Mm. Like we're talking like it smelled so bad in some of these cells, we would power wash them through the trap and like kind of like force the guy, like these guy, this guy didn't even want to come out of his cell. We had to like beg him to go outside just so we can clean it. So it's not like a hazardous situation. Right. You know, there was other guys that had psychotic breaks. Like there was this one guy, I forget his name, but he, um, you could tell like he, something happened with his face. Like he started like peeling his face off. Um, a big thing, like a big culture shock was nobody in New York is smoking meth. I don't know if they are now, but I never heard of anybody that smoked meth in New York. You go to Arizona and it's so prevalent. So you hear people talking about it. You would hear the same story over and over. It's like, you know, I was making a lot of money. I was in real estate or construction or whatever. And I got introduced to meth and I was partying and then I got hooked on it. And I, I was just up for 10 days straight and I had a psychotic break and I, I started hearing things and, you know, I just beat somebody with a shovel at a gas station for no reason and caught 12 years for it. Mm. Right. Mm. And it, it's like, it goes back to what I said before. It's like, like we're all just one little fucking inch, issue away. Right. Like, especially here in Florida, everybody getting hooked on pills. It's like at the time people were just doing it for peer pressure because they wanted to be cool with their friends. And now it fucked up their whole life, you know? And, and, these guys, it's like, it, it's the crazy things. Like these guys are like, they like, yeah, I, I was successful. Like I had a wife, kids, like I was successful. I just got jammed up in this stuff. And now I'm just in this system and I can't get it together. And, and I remember when I was in college one year, I had uh, my senior year, I had mono. I don't know if either of you have had mono, but I had a bad case. And I remember I would get, so I went to college upstate New York where it's freezing. At one point, my mono was so bad that I, uh, my temperature was like 104 105, maybe that's an exaggeration, but it was so high that I was, ex- I was hallucinating. Right. My roommates found me in the backyard laying in back of my roommate's truck. He's like, bro, what are you doing? I guess because I was so hot. My body was so hot. I just had to cool down. So I just went outside because it's cold out. And I remember thinking like when I was talking to somebody one time, I'm like, 
what if I would have done something when I'm in that like manic, crazy state of mind and right. would have fucked up my whole life? What if I would have gotten in my car or, or just anything? I'm like, God oh, damn, man. Like you see these people and it's like, all right, you know, things happen. It's like you hear one story, the next story, the next story. And then you see guys that it's like with these old numbers. And I was talking to this guy I worked with. He's like, yeah, this, this inmate, he has like, like Muhammad Ali syndrome, like what's it called? Like all those blows to the head and he's just like delayed and he's like uh, um, slow. Yeah, and, yeah, where they've got that, the little tiny micro, like s little um, twitches, cysts or something in their, in their skull. Kind of like the, that the, the, um, the football players get, right? CTE. Yeah, is that it? Okay. Yeah, I think it's CTE, is that what it's called? But um, I would hear stories of like, yeah, the, you know, this guy's been down since the 80s and he was a cell warrior. He's like, that cell door open, he was, he was pounding on anybody, his celly, his, his, his staff, whoever it was, like all these years of all the blows to the head. And this is the final product of him. And I'm like, what a horrible job of rehabilitation that was. Right. That yard was, like I said, it, it kind of sparked the interest with the, the SMI stuff. And like you, you would, there's another inmate, I'll leave his name out of it. Cause he's still in there. Um, this guy is very low functioning, right? Like, right. A lot of people in prison are a little functional. Yeah. We all know that. But he knew how to try to hang himself by making rope out of toilet paper and paper towels. Seems pretty high functioning, actually. I'm not well, sure. Well, you I think, you, th exactly, you would yeah. think you're like, I don't know how to do this shit, but yeah. it's like I can take a zero Bob Barker roll of toilet paper. I don't know if Bob Barker does all the federal yeah, stuff. Yeah, they do. Yeah, yeah, the yeah little clear do. tubes of toothpaste and all yeah. that stuff. And the, the Bob Barker uh, shower slides. And, oh, Bob Barker. Yeah. Price is right. Price of, he got the price of everything, that guy. But, um, you know, I'm like, I would hear stories like, how is he hanging himself? He's on watch all the time. And it's like, he has toilet paper. He rips it, like rolls it up, seals right. the ends with toothpaste. Does that again, does that again, braids it. So now you have three little strands that you braided into one. Now you do that two more times. Now you have three braids and you braid that together. And he even showed me, like, I'll show you how to do it. And it was like, it was like rope that you, like I could jump off a cliff with it and it would still support me. Mm. So this is like your typical MA. It's like, this, this guy's never going to be another one. He like smoking meth, psychotic breakdown, constantly on watch. You ever on a constant watch? Me? Yeah. No. no. I know you do your time in the hole, but there was a lot of guys that be, so you know when you're on the watch, you get that green or yellow smock. You can't rip that fucking thing. Like, you, you can't. It's too, oh, it's too. They, they call them uh, the suicide smock, the turtle shell. Yeah, tur the turtle suits. Yeah, the turtle suits. So I would see this guy and he's just constantly on watch and you would hear him briefing like, Cox, you're sitting on, you're sitting on this watch. Tadaldi, you're sitting on this watch. And I'm like, people are like, I don't want to sit on him because they know it's like five minutes in, he's going to just flip the fuck out. So I would see a lot of guys like at this point, I've only been doing this for not even a year. I'm like, who can I, I can't tell somebody else been doing this for 20 years, how to do their job. Right. I just had a little bit different approach. I was like, instead of being that CO, that's like, shut up inmate or just give them what they like, don't acknowledge him unless it's like for medication or right. psych or whatever. And I was like, let me just try to like engage with this guy a little bit. Like he's clearly a low function. I'm the only person this guy has to talk to. Right. And like I said, I'm not a hug a thug, but I was like, let me just try to make this day easier for myself. Teaches me the alphabet, you know, the whole hand signal shit. Cause I was like, all right, that's good for me to know. Not that I can keep up with people that are fucking talking with both hands and two different people. Like, you guys are pros, but he taught me sign language. Like, all right, you know, that's, that's productive, I guess. I'm, I'm, I'm keeping him entertained. Right. And he starts telling me, you know, his mom was a lawyer and I, cause I know it's like, he gets a lot of store, a lot. And I'm like, who the fuck cares about this guy? And he would get his store, his hundred dollars worth. And he would just give it all out. And I'm like, dude, you need to stop doing this. People are taking advantage of you. Right. He would go on watch because he would expect something back from the guy. They wouldn't happen. It was never going to happen. So he starts telling me one day, I was like, all right, I got to keep this guy calm. I was like, tell me how you lost all your teeth. All right. He was, you know, prison, these guys have no teeth, whatever. So, this is the most honest thing I've ever heard an inmate say. He says to me, he's like, yeah, I've been in prison since 2008 and I've been in a lot of fights, but I haven't won a single one. I was like, That's honest. Usually guys talk about their breaking necks and yeah. you know, smashing in people's skulls. He's like, yeah, I never want to fight. And I'm like, all right, well, thank you for the honesty. And he's like, yeah, this tooth, you know, I was at, I was at Buckley and I told some black guy he should, his children should get hung from a tree and I lost a tooth. And then this tooth, 
<laughs> so he's, you're, bring, you're bringing these fights. He's bringing on. on himself. He's like this guy. Um, I asked a, 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 a guy with a swastika if his last name was was Cohen, and it's typical stuff. And uh, then he tells me this one tooth. Like, what about that tooth? It's like front tooth. He's like, yeah. I was giving this guy a blowjob one time, and I was using too much teeth. And he, he, I got scared. And then he said, if I use too much teeth, he's going to hit me. And then he hit me. And then I had uh, blood, tooth, and cum all in my mouth at the same time. Oh, Jesus. So it's like, this is like 7 a.m. Yeah. It's like, this is like, like the guy I was talking about before that was eating his own feces. Yeah. I remember I called my mom after the first time because you see it once, it's like, all right, whatever. So I'm seeing him eat his feces. Oh I'm eating my breakfast. He's eating his breakfast. Right. And I remember calling my mom, like, mom, it, Am I fucked up if I could watch another guy eat his own feces and I'm eating my breakfast and it doesn't bother me? And she's like, I was a nurse for 30 years. Like, you just get used to the shit. You just got used to it quicker. Yeah. So like, all right. You know, this is all like my first year. You start seeing stuff. You get the uses of force, the basic stuff. But I had to venture out. I had to, I had to go to like the real pens just to see what's like. I didn't want that violence. I didn't, like I said, I just, I got to see what it's like. Right, it's like if you're in the military, like you almost want to see combat, even though right. it's like, why would you want to see that? So when I start seeing everybody like snitching on people, I'm like, you know, I'm gonna go down to these other units and do overtime down there. So I was in Phoenix. You can go. I lived on the East Valley. You can go an hour away. There's a whole big ass prison. There's two prisons. One called Florence, which is the town, Florence, Arizona. There's Florence Prison, which is South Unit, which is Chomos. East Unit was a Minimum camp, north was a worker dorm, central was like a four yard, like a pen. So you can just go down there and show up anytime you want. Like they'll never take, they'll never say no, they're so short staffed. Right. So I would kind of do rounds. I was like, I'm going to go to East Unit one day, South, North, whatever. And what I used to do is like when I would work my six to two, I would go home, eat, shower, maybe sleep a little bit, go down there and work four to 10 because then I had to go home and then go back to work at my unit the next day because the unit I worked at, there wasn't always overtime. Right. You know, if there's a lot of, you know, people getting hurt or whatever, like it would be there, but then it wouldn't be. But you go down to Central, it's always, they're so short staffed. And I was like, you walk in and it's like, you got the big, it's like the walls and the nickname Gladiator School. It's like, I don't think every prison in America was Gladiator School. Just throwing that out. Every prison is Gladiator School. It's like, no, yeah. guys, we get it. We, there's only so many things that can happen. People get stabbed. We get it. Gladiator School. You had to put in work. You had to fight. You had to deal with the politics. So you go there and... I used to go to the back to CB6, right? Go to Casson. Casson's the, the, the mental, uh, the high custody mental health yard. So you go there and it's just like, it's single man cells. These cells are tiny. Like you see guys, it's like, okay, they're, they're like the bed is as long as this table and this table's like five, eight. So it's like the majority of the people in here can't fit in this bed. Right. You know, you see guys standing up and they're above like the top of the cell doors. But I'm like, this is like, this is like the dangerous crazy guys and they're all single man cells and the banging and the screaming. And there was this one guy who would constantly lick his fingertips. I mean, day and night he was doing this. And it's like, you have to get raw doing that. Right. But, you know, you'd see guys that are just like, they got brains of like four year olds, five year olds. Like, what are you in here for? Right. And you have guys who are like, yeah, I was just born black at the wrong time. <laughs> and it's like, what did this, like what I couldn't imagine being like, older black guy, like in the seventies or the eighties, it's like with the way the justice system is like, like picture these guys in like the South, like Angola and Louisiana. It's right. like, man, like you guys are fucked. Like even if you were innocent, you're fucked. You know, that goes back to like, you, you look at these guys, like at one point you were just a regular guy. So I started doing overtime down there. I started doing overtime right down the street from Florence is a, a whole other complex called Iman. So I'm in his SMU, which is where I wound up working at. Then there's two Chomo yards, uh, IHP yard, which is like integrated housing. That's like, uh, it's like, uh, you got the political guys, right? Like I hang out with the blacks, so the whites with the whites, the Mexicans with the Mexicans. But then when they get like tired of this, like I got to do another 50 years before I get out of here. Yeah, I don't want to deal with these politics. So I'll go to an IHP yard. It's like, it's PC, but we're not PCing. So you'll have like a black tranny with a white skinhead. Right. But they're like, we signed IHP, we're cool. Yeah, yeah. You, we know on the regular on the, on, on the regular yard that you would never sell up with each other. All right. So you see that, um, but it's like, I, don't, I, I guess the feds might be a little different, but in state prison, everybody knows everybody. 
Everybody knows everybody's business. Everybody knows where everybody's from. Another story. This this is. Well, I mean, how many people are in the in fifty thousand? Fifty. I was going to say there's over a hundred thousand in the federal system, and fifty thousand just in Arizona. And back to the, the CB six stuff, and and I think part of the reason why. I was exposed to criminals from the time that all the time being at the club. Right. Right. And I'm like, these guys are, are pretty decent, you know, not, not decent. Like you have a lot of assholes here and there, but it's like, if you just speak to people the right way, right. You'll be fine. Like if there's situations where like, there's no words can get us out of this, like, all right, you, we have to do what we have to do. But I wanted to go to the other yards because I wanted to see what it was really like. Right. So like I said, when I would go down to central, you would, you, you know, or I'm sorry, go down to Florence. You could be at Central one day, which is like the oldest prison in Arizona. It's where the death row guys used to be, you know, but it's like your typical, it's like three tiers, you know, with a wall on the other side and, and or CB2 is like, I think a hundred years old. And it's like 27 cells, three high, 27 cells, three high. You go there and it's like you start seeing like real prison stuff. You start seeing like, you know, one time back half George, one time front half Henry, like, the things when people say like, how do people get raped in prison or do drugs? Don't they get caught? It's like, no, because A, we're only walking around once every hour and B, everybody is shouting out that we're coming. So if you get caught, you're an asshole. Yeah. And that was when you start seeing like, that's when I started like, like these guys are like inmates that are like, are you guys acting this way because you're here? Are you guys acting this way because this has been your whole life since you're a, a kid growing up with your dad's in, in prison and gangs and your mom's out doing whatever and your brothers are here. Like, you know, this is a different yard. This is like, you got your politics. Like if a, if two black guys are fighting over there and you're a white guy, you just keep moving. You don't even turn your head. You know, if it's two white guys fighting, you don't turn your head. And I think there's a, a misconception and I could be wrong, but like when you hear these stories about people getting beat up in prison or people getting stabbed, it's like a lot of the time they were stabbed by their own people mm -hmm. because they did something wrong. Or they did something that was against this stupid politics and this culture. You know, you're a white guy. You're going to hang with us and go beat the shit out of that guy. It's like, dude, I only have 30 fucking months here. Right. I want to do my time. You just want to get everything out of me that you can to better the cause. Right. It's like, all right, you know, you can, you can relate to anybody in prison. You could talk to anybody. It's just knowing how to talk to different people. And well, I always say that it's, um, if you get stabbed in prison, like you, you, you had it coming. You probably had it coming. You know, like like it's and unfortunately it's and, and I'm not saying it's 100 percent of the time, but 99 percent of the time you you brought it on yourself because usually they've given you multiple opportunities. Like they don't. They, first of all, we got to get somebody to go do this, and that guy basically has a, a good chance of him being shipped himself. Right. So now I got to have you come, convince you to go stab this guy or beat this guy up. You're going to be shipped, by the way. And of course, you you might be like, bro, I'm- I'm closer I'm to home. Close to my house. Like I get visits. I get like, why am I, what's happening here? So yeah, usually, and usually they've given the guy multiple opportunities to, yeah. to check in, to make it right, to pay this, to apologize, to do something to try and fix it. Right. It's not like your, your first offense is like you're getting stabbed tomorrow at chow time or yeah. this is that, this is what's going to happen. Right. You know, it, I think it's, like I said before, like- <laughs> Prisons only have a certain level of accessibility to the public. That's why they're so interesting to people. Right? You could see it in movies. You could see it on podcasts. And it's not like what you see. It's not race riots every day. It's not people doing 3,000 burpees a day and eating 10 bags of tuna. And it, it's just, it's not realistic. No one can right. operate with that level of aggression and frustration and anger for that long. You're going to bust a capillary in your head and die. Right. Most of the times you're walking around, dudes are just watching TV, doing this, doing that. But mind you, at this time, I was at the Phoenix yard. I was just spreading out to seeing what all these other yards are like. So I made my round, my rounds through all of Central. Then I go down the street to Iman. So you have SMU, SMU Special Management Unit. It's a, a five yard. So guys aren't coming out unless they're cuffed up. Like the, there was chomos there, like it's four wings, Right. And then each wing has four clusters and then each cluster has six pots. So it's five cells or four or five cells stacked too high. And then you're just looking out at a concrete wall. So that's where you see guys like fishing stuff. And, but those guys are burnt all day, all day. They're just burnt in those cells and it's hot in Arizona. You're cooking. Mm -hmm. The craziest thing was guys yeah, used to see, 
They're swamp coolers, but maybe they were repaired by some HVAC guy in, in colonial times. Like, oh, I'm sure you're cooking in there, man. <laughs> Fuck, guys would just sit on the concrete all day and sweat. Um, a lot of guys used to say that the time there goes by faster than at open yards. And the shoe? It's basically the shoe, but you're just housed there. Like, they, get, they had wreck and all that stuff, but you're like, okay, you had wreck and showers every other day. Um, when I was working, I actually wound up working there full time down the road, but you were working 12 hour days, which I liked better. I like 12s better than eights, but who cares? It's not important. Um, you would go there and you could have wing four. It's closed now. That's not really my talking about it, but you could have wing four is like the political guys, like blacks with blacks, whites with whites and, uh, natives with natives or natives with Mexicans. So let's say the back half of wing four, Baker, Charlie, that's all that political bullshit. The front half is the guys that want to PC up. And I can't tell you how many guys you go, you, I leave work on my Friday and I come back on my Monday and it's like, there's a lot of you guys from the back half that are now in the front half. It's like, you guys PC up that quick over God knows what a fucking bag of tuna, a bag of this, a bag of that, whatever it was like, I thought you guys were living this life. I thought you, you, you were about all this anyway, but it's like, I never had any issues there. You know, I can respect the guys that like, you always see those guys that like are trying to fight their case Mm -hmm. or trying to better themselves, Mm -hmm. but they're just the overall population is like, fuck that dude. You're just going to be this, just go with the flow. It's like, I can respect that guy that is trying to, to get his shit together, trying to give himself a fighting chance, holding on to that optimism. So you would see things like, you know, you walk past and it'll be like the guys are, they're working out at this time or watching young and the restless. A lot of soap operas. In a lot of soap operas. They, of soap love, opera. the soap they opera. love the soap operas. They love the soap operas. And they, and they know the, the price of everything on the price is right. It's bullshit. Cause guys, like I remember, I remember when I first went to central, I, would, I was at dialysis and these guys are coming in and they're doing the, the, the thing where you get like a boat, a vacation and like a refrigerator or something. And, um, they're like, yeah, it's 28,490. And the other guy, and it's like, yeah, he's right. Like that was on there 11 months ago. And I'm like, you guys fucking suck. I was trying to sit here and guess you ruin it. He's like, dude, we have nothing to do. Yeah. I mean, I didn't even think about that. But I remember this, uh, this one Mexican guy, this is great. This is how I got my, my nickname in prison, which is a word I've used in this podcast, but you'll never, you'll never understand it. So as you know, in prison, everybody has a last name or a nickname. Mm-hmm. Nobody has a first name. My last name is Tadaldi. Not common, doesn't roll off the tongue that easily, whatever. When we do our walks, if I'm in, if there's two of us in a wing, if I do pods one, I do odds or even. So if I do one, three, and five, I do one, three, and five the whole shift because whatever inmates I might have spoken to about something last walk, you know, I might have an answer for them the following walk, whatever it is. You go up and you see this guy, there's was, there was this Mexican guy and he's like trying to learn how to speak English. Mm-hmm. He didn't have a lot of stuff in his cell. He didn't have a TV, he didn't have a lot of stuff. He's like trying to learn how to speak English. I respect it. You know, I, I don't know anything about him. I don't know how much time he's done, whatever. So he's reading, he's a short guy. So he's reading my shirt and he's like, I'm like, all right, cool. You got it. Right. By the time I walk down the run and come back, he forgot. Come back the next walk. Cool. Next walk. Ted Aldi. I'm like, cool. He's getting it. He's not gonna remember by tomorrow, but mm-hmm. he's he's getting it. The next walk I come around, and at that unit, the bubble was up top. So the control room was up top. They had to open the doors themselves. So there were cell doors, pod doors, cluster doors. So you would hear the pod doors opening, and they would know that we were coming around because otherwise they're closed. And I, I hear the guy say, he said it in Spanish, like he's, to the guy next to him, oh yeah, como se llama esa, esa policía, esa, esa nombre de la policía, muy alto. What's the tall guy's name? He's like, I don't want to say, eso tamale? Eso tamale? <sighs> and I heard that walking in and everybody started laughing. So for the whole rest of my fucking time there, I was tamale. And I was like, you know what? It's not disrespectful. Like, mm. it's harmless. Like, I'll go with it. It's not like he's calling me like buttercup or some shit. Like, whatever. So I was officer tamale. It didn't help that I was wearing a beige uniform with brown pants. Um, I was going to say, they, <laughs> the guards would all have, they'd have like, they had a guy named Sniper. They had a guy named, you know, the, all the guards had, uh, well, and some of them just had, yeah, like you said, their last name. If it's a con, like if, if you're, if you're an officer and you're Cox, okay, you're Cox, yeah. but nobody wants to say Tadaldi all day. Like, yeah. who the fuck wants to say that shit? Well, I was going to say, what was it? Um, 
it was it was really funny was when the cops would call the inmates by their nicknames. <laughs> Like we had a guy named Porn Star, and you'd have like a female cop, and she'd be like, "Porn Star, get over here!" And he, and you're like, "Did the, is this is a setup? Did the cop just call him Porn Star?" And his name, his nickname was Porn Star because he had all the dirty magazines. And the he, one that was renting them out. Yeah, he'd rent them out. Yeah. yeah, come back all crusty. Yeah, so he was Porn Star. Yeah, but and somebody was like, "Why is it? Why do they call him Porn Star?" I'm like, "Well, first of all, he had his neck fused right from it, uh, the sp- uh, spinal." Um, the whatever the vertebrae were all fused together, so like so, Frankenstein. Yeah, so like he this. turned like this, you know. So he, he and he, it was kicked kind of forward. So he's like, <laughs> and he would he would hey Cox, what uh, what they say up there, you know? And I go, they said such and such. Oh, okay. And so like you'd look at like this was not a porn star, and I was like, well, it's not because somebody's like, why do they call him porn star? It's like the guy's named Tiny, and he's like six eight, yeah. four hundred pounds. Yeah, or you have yeah, you have Gordo. You know, you have, yeah, this it's a lot of the same names over and over again. But it, it, it's just funny. It's, it's like I said before, everybody fucking knows everybody. It's like that name haunted me. Everybody knew. I'm like, you're in wing one. You can't even hear wing four. How right. do you know? But whatever. Like I said, I went with it. It was harmless. It was funny. But um, that unit, they mixed a lot of, um, like I said, wing one would be uh, the political guys. And then wing three would be detention. So that could be assholes from all over the state. You walk down wing three, it's like, who are you guys? Where have you come from? And you'll see guys, it's like, well, there's like this other guy with a swastika on his forehead and he's, he's, um, he's blind and he only has one leg and it's just constantly with the racial, I could, I could show you a picture of it. I don't know if you want to see it, but, um, you want to see it? (laughs) Sure. This is, this is the type of stuff you see in, in, in state prison. Yeah, I was like, remember the guy with the forehead? I told you he had uh, the tattoos on his forehead and, and on his face. <laughs> the, he was the, tattooed everywhere. The horns. Yeah, and I remember when I talked to him, I was like, bro, why did you do that? He's like, when I came in the system, I had, he had like, whatever, let's say 10 years to do in the state and then five years to do in the feds, right? Mm-hmm. I was like, okay. He's like, well, they sent me, the prison they sent him to, he said, literally almost every other day somebody was getting killed being stabbed he's like that's how bad it was he said and i was joined a gang to try and just to be safe he's like you don't you have to like he was actually a very normal guy when you talk to him right a lot of them are yeah and then you're sitting there talking to and he says um he said and to be honest matt he said after the first year he's like i didn't think i was gonna make it like i saw guys coming in with five years and getting stabbed or guys getting killed or guys he's like it was that bad of a prison he's now this was 15 years ago or, or whatever 10 years ago he said so I never thought it was going to fin- – and I think the sentence was like 15. He did 10. God, that seems like an attorney. I couldn't imagine being – Well, so then he gets out after 10 years. He goes, now I'm going to the Fed to do my Fed time. Yuck. He said – That's better than state. It's better than state. He said, so I've got five years. He goes, I can – he's which basically I'll be out in four. He goes, I can be – he's I can do four years in the Fed like it, like it's a joke. He's that's nothing. And he was like – he said, so – he goes, I didn't think I was going to survive. I would hear guys say that they wanted, like, I'll do five years in the feds as opposed to doing two in state. Like, oh, that's, yeah. That's yeah. the type of shit you yeah. hear all well, the time. His The reason he got the t- tattoos was he thought, you know, fuck it, I'm never leaving this place alive. I might as well do, you know, yeah, I'll get this tattooed on me. Yeah, I'll get this tat- eh, tattoo. Some, you know what would be cool? Tattoo some. I like this picture. Tattoo those horns on my forehead. Like, he's like, you know, you just do nuts, crazy stuff. He said, this is- I was like, yeah, but oh, my God. Yeah. This is the exact representation of state prison. And it's like, all right, he's in detention and he's calling the next guy perverts and there's all these N-bombs in here. And I'm like, dude, you're a pervert. Like, you yourself are a pervert. <laughs> oh, he thinks, I'm not a pervert. It's like, be- because you're blind with your cataract eyes, you think that that justifies what you did? And it's one thing of like, look, if you're a pervert, you're an asshole, you did what you did, you keep your mouth shut. But this guy's like, Loud, no. loud, and kicking the door with his one leg, and and pissing on the floor, and it's like, um, <sighs> what what's funny to me is uh, that the guys that would walk around talk about, you know, fucking guy over there's a snitch, and I'd be thinking, like, I know you snitched, like I I did your paperwork, like I I've looked at your case, like you know we've talked about, it. and then they forget they told you, and they're like, ah, fuck, and it's like, what are you doing? So I see that all the time. Um, it's the same thing I, I, you would find out. I, I had a guy who was locked up. Same thing. 
uh, everybody thought he was locked up for like weed or something, but really he was l- looking at pictures of little kids on the internet and he's locked up and he's going around like, fucking that guy's a fucking sicko over there. It's like, but what do you do? Who are you talking to? Like, I know what you're here for. Like, just cause you got these other guys convinced. He said, and the guys with the, I like the guys that when they get the glasses, they intentionally get the Chomo 3000. Yeah, it's yeah. like, you could have picked any other lens that is still not going to look good on you, you pick the Chomo 3000s. Yeah, these are the thick, thick, the, 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 the bars, and then they're like rounded. It's like, dude, you're, you're, it's, you know, it's like, you're, okay, I get it. You go to church, you're just like a fucking priest all the time. But, um, and I think it's funny because, like, all these things that you're talking about, I do my walk, I deal with, like, there's inmates I didn't speak to for years. I never had to speak to them. There's inmates every fucking walk they want to talk about something. Yeah. But, you're going to, it was easy for me to move around because it's like, look, you're still people. You, for all I know, you may be innocent, right. you know? And it's like, you live that gang life, that street life. I was dealing with that for years, making money off you guys. You know, you're just here now. It's like, I'm not going to talk down to you. Like you'd see these guys, I would see guys that I was working with that they were like, you know, don't think you can ask me anything until your uniform is in compliance. You take down your laundry line oh, and you take the cover off your light. And I was like, listen, let me tell you how this should go. Hey, Cox, Sergeant, whomever is coming through later. Can you just take this shit down, let him do his walk, and then he could fucking bounce and then put it all back up to normal? Right. I got you. Yeah. I got you, Tom. Yeah, no, no worries. That's, you're you're going to get a lot further with that because then they're like, cool, he's on my side. Right. He's not a dick. I'm going to comply as opposed to the other guy. Go fuck yourself. Like, I'm not taking it down. Damn. Like, now you just made it so much worse where if right. you made it seem like, hey, bro, I'm – I'm with you. I get it. I understand. You got a lot of time. You want to be comfortable, but do me a favor. In about an hour, this guy's going to come. It's around. like make you want to like I tell people. Like, you want to go to work for what we get paid and argue with. There's a thousand. We're, we're responsible for 458 people. Just me and you. All right. You want to argue with? They're gonna be here tomorrow. Well, you know another thing is. Um, I used to hate that. I, 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 you know, there would be guys that it, this happened more at the medium, than, but it did happen at the low too. Or, where the guy that the. the the tattoo guy would go into the CO and he'd go, listen, <laughs> man, I got a guy. I got a guy. I tattoo. You know I tattoo. And they're like, right. He'd go, I got a guy. He's coming in. I'm supposed to tattoo him. Like, I don't want to be disrespectful. And they go, listen, fucking a lieutenant comes around at seven. Do you understand? So you make sure you have your lookout. When he comes around, don't have anything out. Go separate ways. Wait till he comes. Talks to me. I sign. We sign the papers and leave. Like don't don't. Let get him do his post check. Let that door slam right. so you know he's out, and then go back to what right. you're doing. Right. You don't have to worry about me. I'm not going to fuck with you. But if you get me fucked up with this with this with right. the lieutenant, right. then you're going to have a problem. They're like, no, no, no. I get it, bro. I get it. They're like, so don't get some idiot for your lookout. Don't have a, an idiot as a lookout. You he's going to fall asleep. Right. It's funny too. When you said they they would say coming. You know, in 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 a. In Coleman, at least, that they would just, they, they wouldn't say come and they go, whoop, 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 whoop. You ever hear the whoop, whoop? That mm-hmm. just means the cops are coming, like, like mm-hmm. the police. And they never call them, they don't call them COs, you know, mm-hmm. they're always, always the police. Something. It's the popo. So the cops. Yeah, the one cops. Time. Cops are coming. But, but, they're not cops. Like in the unit, yeah, we're not. <laughs> like I used to, CO. I used to say, I used to say, I, I, back to the Phoenix arc. So, like, you know, at an intake yard, you don't have a, a watch, you don't know what time it is, you don't know anything. I used to hear guys bang, like, hey, CO, CO, what time is it? I'm like, bro, I'm a prison guard. He's a CO. Talk to him. I don't know anything, dude. Same fucking uniform, same job. Like, yeah, what time is it? He told me to ask you. But that's uh, just typical jazz. Like, another thing, um, this is another thing that killed me is the, the way time is perceived in prison, right? So the guys at the intake yard, they go there, they get processed, then they get, so I remember one time I got called in, because I was like a max custody guy, whatever. He's coughed, take him to his cell, open the trap, take the cuffs off of him, and I hear somebody banging on the glass. And when you come from intake to Delta or Echo, that's what they're called, everybody's up looking at you, because like, oh, I know him from County, I know him from Rincon, whatever it is. So uh, everybody's hounding this guy, where are you from, fool? What you, uh, he's looking around, looking around, looking around. And then I hear somebody call his, like a name only he would know, like, Whatever, whatever his yeah, nickname is. Yeah, T-Dog. Some shit. And uh, he turns around, and he's like, he's like, how much time you guys? Like, man, these fools gave me 15 flat. And he's like, that ain't shit. I ain't tripping on it. You know why? I got nine months back time in county. I'm like. So nine months off So your what 15. are you talking about? You have 15 flat. You got nine months back time in county? What the fuck you're worried about? You think you're, you're at the, the exit gate? All right. It's just like things that just get normalized. It's like, okay, like you're, you're, you know, make sure you don't, don't even unpack your shit. You're rolling back out of here soon going home. Like dog, you 
We're not exactly at the finish line. You're still at the starting gate, but what can I tell you about that? That'll stick with me forever. He's like, they gave me 15 flat. I got yeah, back time in County, bro. I'm, I'm, I'm over, I'm about to be over this. I'm like, <sighs> um, I was like the, uh, um, well, you know, the, the COs in, in Coleman would get upset if you called them a guard. <laughs> they would they get they go they go state Walking around with a dick st- measuring contest. They could be like the state has guards. I'm not a guard. I'm a CIA. I'm a correctional officer. It's like oh, what what you know. It's like all right, you know. Okay, guy. It's just silly. Um, God, they, they were, yeah, there were some real dickheads. Um, there was a guy who fought MMA. MMA or C- no, no no. This was a guard. Listen. I they bet he fought. was the coolest person in that bitch. No, he, he was probably horrible. wanted. He was really? horrible. Oh, he's he one was, of those. He's like, I'm going to flex my chest everywhere yeah, I go. It, his name was Solo, and he literally, like, you know, he'd just be walking down. And he'd go, "Hey, inmate, you know, turn around," and he, you know, just to search somebody randomly, right? And he'd grab them. They'd be like, "Hey, man!" And then that was it to him. Dump it him. Boom. Flip them. I mean, listen, I literally would. You'd be, you'd be looking at there'd be the walls are five foot, right? That the, the um, cubicles. So the low, just over I can you can just see <laughs> over them, and I mean I hear, hey inmate, what the fuck you? And you, all I saw was legs in the air. Woo, boom! And you hear that slam, and it's like holy shit. So you walk around just to kind of take a look, right? As I'm kind of leaving, you know, and he's got this guy just, oh sorry, he's got them all wrapped up and pinned. You know, he's got them all tied up like in a like a pretzel. You know, and it's like Jesus. And he did this. This is like every few days. This happened. He was throwing. And the other, even the, listen, the other COs said, oh, yeah, Solo, yeah, he's a dick. Like, they all hated his guts. You know, and that's, and, and that's, he had a bunch of swastikas and, and, and um, SS and stuff on his arms. Lightning he, bolts, 88 yeah. on his knuckles. You know, he had to have, they hired him, but he had to wear a sleeve. sleeve. So they had a sleeve to cover all his tattoos because they were all racial stuff. And yeah. he's beating dudes' asses left and right. I never once. Walked into any unit, and I, I'll get into Lewis later on. I never walked into any unit and said, I want to flex my authority on these people. I want to put you on report. I don't want to do fucking paperwork and have to talk to some jerk off sergeant I don't even like. Look, this is this might not go over well with some of your viewers that are in this line of work. In prison, from my perspective, it's not even the fucking inmates that are the problem. It's the people you work with. But like right. I said, you're putting all of us in the same uniform, same training. We're not friends. Right. You know, and I'm not saying like you can't be friends. There's people I'm friends with that I talk to every day I used to work with, but it's just like, I don't want to work with this fool. Like, I'd rather do wing one by myself. I'd rather do double the work to not have to work with this person. Well, it's funny. We, why well, I talked to, I've talked to other, um, uh, you know, uh, other COs and stuff. And, and one of the things is because at least in the federal system, they have like a really good union. So it's almost impossible to fire them. So you have to, they have to get convicted of like a crime to get rid of them. And so what they do instead is- They, it, wrote, it, they move them. They move them. Yeah. But you can't force someone to relocate in the federal system unless it is- um, So they, they would offer them, hey, you know, we got a position here and you could move here. And they're like, oh, I'm getting paid the same. I don't want to move there. Right. Why would I move to Minneapolis right. when I live in and Texas? I, and you can't fire me. So what they do is they say it's so if, if a position opens up that is a, um, a raise or a, you know you're getting a promotion, okay. so it's like okay hey you're you're <laughs> the worse you do the more you move up exactly. Mm-hmm. So I was like how bad does the bureau the the top of the bureau of prisons have to be and 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 this happens all the time. That's funny you say that. So these guys would get moved up. Well, there was a woman at the pen, uh, uh, this black chick at the pen that was at the at the low. And she was a fucking terror, bro. Everybody hated her. And she was a lieutenant. Well, it, it came come to find out they moved her from the pen because she was under investigation. One, she got a DUI. Two, she was under investigation. Now, she had been... She got a... And she was under investigation for something else besides a DUI? So yes. While she's got right. that and dealing with that, she well, goes under investigation. Combined. Here's what happened. She's, she's at the pen. She's harassing a new officer a married officer that she's tr- she wants to get with. She's texting him inappropriate stuff, I everything. Think I, I think I know the story. So so what happens is at one point, she's harassing him like really like bad, like to the point where I think he even put something in where he was like, hey, she's harassing me. I want her to leave me alone. He's one because, of those. He went to HR. If be, you do that, you shit, you're dead. Because his wife had knew what was happening. So she's furious. What happens is the chick gets pulled over not far from where they live and gets a DUI. The cop says, I'll let you off 
we'll leave your car here, but somebody has to come pick you up. Because if I put you in that car. He calls the guy. She calls the she guy. She texts the guy and says, come, I need, I'm begging you to just come get me and drop me off at my place. It'll, I'll make it worth your while. I'll suck your dick. I mean, while the guy's it, at home with his wife or something? Yeah, it's like 11, 12, 1 o'clock in the morning or something. He, is, he gets this. His wife's like, give me your phone, looks at it, and she's like, oh, no. So I, I think that's when he ends up calling like HR and what's, yeah. what he files a complaint against her. And he's got the text. And, of course, she ends up – I think she ends up getting the DUI. So they move her from the pen to the low, and she's, she's just a complete bitch. Like, she's walking around. She's just – Fucking with every single person she can, just absolutely evil. It's like, you just got a DUI. They can't, I mean, for, they can't seem to fire her. Ultimately, I think she moved, she got some kind of a, they moved her across the country and gave her some kind of a, a new position or convinced her to, to take another position and leave because she was such a problem. But that's what happens. They become a problem mm -hmm. and they just ship them somewhere else. I, I, I say it to her, I says, okay, once you get above a lieutenant, Right. With AZDOC, it's like, okay, CO, Sergeant, Lieutenant. Once you get past Lieutenant, like Captain Major, like what, who did you burn to get here? Right. Who did you, like if you're if you're a Lieutenant at one place, it's like some inmate died on, on a constant watch. They're going to move you to this prison and same thing, and promote you. And it's just like, it's, 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 it's the only line of work where the worse you are, the better you do. Right. And that's my thing. It's like, I'm not kissing ass. I don't want to play game. I don't, I just want to do my fucking job. I'll give these guys what they got coming. I don't mind passing around a bag of tortillas to another guy. Another officer will be like, absolutely not. I'm going to write you off for doing that because you're going to get compromised. Like, no, dude, you know what? Maybe if this guy gives his friend over there a bag of tortillas and you look, there's nothing in it. Mm -hmm. Maybe my day might go a little smoother. All right. Maybe these guys, no, no, Tadal, he's cool. We're not going to, we're not going to, we don't try to get over on him. He's cool. He's, he's respectful to us. He gives what we got coming and don't get it wrong. If you're an asshole and I do what I have to do, I'll do what I have to do. Right. So, you know, it is what it is. I, signed up to be in this environment. Like I, I couldn't stand when people, you would hear people like they would get thrown on. Like these guys know, like if you throw on somebody, then you get moved. If you were saw an officer, then you get moved if you don't want to PC up. So you would have people that would complain, this fucking guy just threw piss on me. It's like you're, you're a, a CO in a mental health yard. What did you think was going to happen? All right, they're all going to behave well. You think they're, they're all going to behave? You're going to give them graham crackers and put them in front of the TV and they're going to be fine? Like they're all, it's, it's, it's what's going to happen. Not for nothing. All this contraband that's in here, who brings this shit in? Yeah. Doesn't just come from Kiwi. Right. Yeah. Can I get an iPhone six off Kiwi for 800? No, it doesn't work like that. People brought it in. Um, <sighs> yeah. What's funny is like after COVID, they, a lot of the CEOs retired or mm -hmm. during COVID they retired because the CEOs were getting sick. Several people died. Several CEOs died. Um, and so the COs were like, look, it's it's rampant here. Like, it's way worse at the prisons than anywhere else. So we're going to, you know, they started taking retirement. Well, the problem is so many of them took retirement. Yeah, they, they left. The new guys came in. They don't know anything. They're seniors in three years. Right, exactly. And that's what, it's funny. My buddy Pete was telling me, he's like, the most senior officer at Coleman Lowe has been here three years. He said, so I believe it. everybody else has been here 18 months, 12 months, 10 months. Six, and after six months, you just don't have the experience to really know what's going on in the prison. Mm -hmm. with, the, with the, when you know most inmates, I mean most guards, they walk into a they walk into a unit, and they hear certain things and they look and see certain things. They know pretty much right, like pretty much they'll be like, okay, something's going on. There's tension. There's a fight. There's going to be going to be a fight. On, Everybody's got their the showers. Right, they got their boots on. They've got they, like some things. I can know something, but a guy that's been there three to six months, he doesn't have a fucking clue. Or, or they smell something. A guy who's been a CEO who's been there ten years would be like, somebody's making hooch. Is somebody is somebody burning batteries to use it as a wick. Yeah, yeah, you know. So, but the the new guys don't. It takes years before you start to figure that out. You would see these guys making hooch. I would walk past guys. So I was like, bro, are you? Let me look. What, what's your number? Oh, three one. Okay, you got to let the air out of that bottle, or it's gonna fucking explode right. and smell like old potatoes in here. Let the fucking air out, dude. I don't care if you're making hooch. Somebody gave you the bread. Somebody gave you the tomato paste to start or whatever it was. Well, and keep in mind, too, these guys are making $35,000 a year. Yeah. So if somebody goes to them in the, in the parking lot and says, man, I'll give you a grand to give this cell phone mm -hmm. to this inmate. They're like, that's a fucking thousand. I, I, used to, I used to hear people say, and like I said, I'm not better than any other man or woman that works here. I'm not. It's just like I said, I'm exposed to different things in my work history and lifestyle. It's like, okay, you bring guys. It's like you were, you were working at In-N-Out before you did this. 
and you just came into work in this environment, right? And you started at this yard, which you might have not known what type of yard it was going to be, but like I would hear guys in the parking lot that say, "Yeah, man, I just got an F two fifty." You know, nineteen twenty year old kids like, right? If you're living at home, the money you're making is pretty good, but it's like I got an F two fifty, I got forty inch tires, a nine inch lift. I only got to work two overtimes a week to pay for it. Like, bro, you want to have the nicest truck in a in a prison parking lot? Like, you're you're right. you're backwards, bro. Like, you're not you're not getting it. And, and it's a stereotype, a lot of like burnout, want to be cops. And I get all of it. And then the way I looked at it, like when COVID hit, I realized I'm like, all right, this is recession proof. You know, like people are losing, like even like look at like now in the tech world, tech's like, oh, most money you're ever going to make. And all these people in Microsoft and Google, they're all getting laid off. But I remember, this is going to get dark real quick. When, uh, when COVID happened, I was still at the, the Phoenix yard, the intake yard. So when they would bring the intake guys, if you violate parole in the Phoenix area, you go to that yard to get processed. Right. If you're in Yuma, which is three hours away, if you're in that area, you just go over there. So they would bring guys in. And I, I've the two guys that I've ever processed, I probably did the paperwork wrong in all honesty. Um, this one guy comes in, high as a kite, smelled like not exactly a Christmas ham. I ship him out, do the whole routine, you know, run through your hair, lift your feet. I'm like, dude, how long has your finger been like that? He's like, what finger? I'm like, dude, where are your fingers looking? We'll figure it out. So he look at his hands and he had a ring on. And the guy was probably like a shade darker than me. His whole finger from the front half of the ring down was dead, black. I mean, like asphalt black. I'm like, how long has your finger been like that? I'm like, when did you get out of prison? He's like, six weeks ago. I'm like, okay, did you have that ring when you left prison? No. So what happened? He's like, I've been getting high the whole time. And I, I, I don't know, I forgot about it. I'm like, you forgot that your finger died. He's like, yeah, dude, I've been getting high. Like, it's not that big a deal. I was like, all right, like call the, the, the emergency thing we have to do. Guy goes to the hospital and he gets it amputated. Oh my God. I thought that was going to be the worst thing I ever saw on a strip out. A couple of weeks later, same thing. I'm doing overtime at, I always used to choose this, this place called Ida just because it was like, it used to be low functioning guys, guys that like you had to tell them to take their medication or mm -hmm. they would just walk up and down the hallway. Like there's one guy, he would always put his shoes on to go to bed and then walk out of the cell and take his shoes off and walk out without shoes. This is the same guy that he would stand in the yard. I remember this and he would always be like, it's Arizona, but it's fucking hot. He'd always be like, did I leave like the stove on? Did I, did I, did I pay that bill? He always like, looked like he was forgetting stuff. All right. It's like Jones. Get out of the fucking sun, dude. You're going to die. You're just standing here in this fixed spot. I get out of the sun, but he, this guy didn't know any better. But we, we had a guy, and so it just reminded me, we had a guy, so they had a, a volleyball court, right? Yeah, we had okay. volleyball too. And uh, Those uncoordinated they, people you're going to see. They had a guy they, they called Sandman because he would lay there and do sand angels. He'd lay down and do sand angels. And so he'd walk around. If you walked behind him, like, he always had sand in his hair. He always had sand. Like, you know, the cops would walk out and yell at him, get up. Shake it off before you go inside yeah. and piss everyone off. Right. That they called him Sam. <laughs> That's pretty cool. So the, the only other, um, Ida, like I said, Ida had the, the low function guys. And the back part of it was like four cells where they would put parole guys until they got processed and dealt with. So I get, I have to go strip this other guy out this one time. And I'm like, this fucking guy is tall, like way taller than me. He's probably like six, nine, six, ten. I check his ID, same exact birthday as me, same day, month, year. And I'm like, we took pretty different paths. Yeah, the right. same starting point, pretty different paths end up in the same place. Guy's a Cheeto. Right. Cheeto is, did you hear what a Cheeto was? It's a transgender Probably. in prison. Now you have to understand in Arizona, we're wearing orange. So the name kind of makes if, sense. if you're a transgender, you wear orange? No, no, everybody wears orange. All oh, the inmates okay. wear orange. But you know, you're you're a cheetah, you're you're a transgender in, in orange, like yeah, Cheeto, Cheeto. fits. Like tamale fits. The goes with my name and I'm wearing beige anyway. Um I'm like this guy's tall. Never never seen him before. He, he didn't buy he wasn't rude, disrespectful, he was night, you know, whatever. So he's probably like six nine, six eight, nine, seven. I'm six, you know, with boots six five, so his tits are right in my face. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I go to strip him out. Like I've stripped out guys before, but I, this guy and the last guy were like, I was like, Jesus, like the the picture, like you go in a bathroom and there's urinals and they have like those little partitions, mm -hmm. so you could have people next to each other, but they yeah. can't see each other. So 
doing a whole routine. He takes off his clothes, strip them out. Um, and I remember looking at him, like he turned around, he did all that. And I'm like, lift your nuts. And I paused for a second, like, what am I looking at? What, what did I miss? I'm thinking, hey, like, did I do like the wrong steps? And he's like, I don't have any nuts. And I'm looking at him like, you don't, that's what's missing. You don't have fucking nuts. And I was like, okay. Well, what did you do? He, he had a hog from like here in Miami. I was like, what is a, a Cheeto? The guy didn't even want it. It was a gigantic. Anyway, but it's like, that's like the things you see in prison that just get normalized. It's like, okay. Um, I like, go, go back in that cell, whatever my sergeant says to go. So he's telling me later on, because the, the door to my, where I would hang out, there was a cell right across from it. So the guy was just talking, like I said, he wasn't bothering anybody. It was like, he was by himself. And uh, he's like, did you ever work at Rast? And that's at Lewis. I'm like, no. Well, yeah, I had, but I wasn't like ever stationed there, but I've worked there. And he's like, yeah, you know, like, you know how a lot of guys in prison, they like telling their business to people. Yeah. And other guys, like, they don't want to tell anything. So he tells me, he's like, I didn't want my nuts. And in Arizona, if you're already receiving hormones, they can't deny you it. They continue. Like you can't go to prison and say I'm transgender and start it unless it's changed. But if you're already, if it's documented that you're already getting it, they'll keep giving it to you. So the guy's like, I just didn't want my nuts anymore. I think I just had too much estrogen in my system. And I just, I just didn't want them. And I'm like, okay, I can understand. Maybe you don't want them, but what exactly was your game plan? And he said, he said something that was so ridiculous. I'm like, I can't even doubt it. He's like, it wasn't that hard. I'm oh. Like, I'm like, what well, wasn't that hard? And he goes, all I did was I took a string out of my boxers, like the ones you make fishing lines with, right. or laundry lines, whatever. I took the string out. I wrapped around my nuts really, really tight, like you would do with a rubber band on your finger. Mm -hmm. And I'm visualizing that. And I'm like, I get it. And he's like, I got really high. He's like, I didn't just do this on a whim. I thought about it. I'm not like the rest of these inmates. <laughs> Okay, yeah, you're worse. You just don't realize it. And uh, he's like, I got really high. I passed out. And when I woke up, my nuts were dead. And he's a white guy. So he's like, they were dead. So I cut him off with a nail clipper. I got high again, cut him off with a nail clipper. But what I didn't account for is how much blood there was going to be. Now, once again, this is like, you know, I just ate Subway. Maybe it was Chipotle. It's like, now nah, I got to hear this in the end. That's all I'll talk about this mm. type of stuff. And then I'm supposed to go home and tell my fiance, Hey baby, a normal day at work. No big deal. I love you. Let's have dinner. So he's like, yeah, you know, I cut him off with a nail clipper. There was just a lot of blood. So thankfully the CO was coming around on his walk and then he, he called, you know, ICS or whatever it was. And, um, that was it. And I was like, so they came and did the rest, snipped them off and no, he snipped them off. He snipped right. them all the way off with a nail clipper. There was blood everywhere. Oh, and then they, shit. Yeah. He snipped them off with the I, nail clipper. I, I didn't realize he, he completed the act. I thought and that's why I started. thought, I'm like, so what happens if they just die? And he's like, well, then I just have dead nuts and they probably would have had to cut them off anyway because then it's like necrosis or something that's going to get in your body and make it worse. But um, his follow-up statement to that was, after he completed that story, he's like, do you have any extra cool, like, you know, the little uh, crystal light things that guys mm -hmm. get? He's like, do you have any more of the cool-ups? I want to put it in my shampoo so it's scented. <laughs> that was his immediate comment after telling me about what just happened last time he was at RAS, which is nuts. I was like, yeah, dude, what do you want? Lemonade or, or pink strawberry? What do you want? <laughs> what do you want, dude? Like, this is the type of stuff you see. So I go to Lewis to start doing overtime. Like I said, Phoenix is here. Florence is a mile east. Phoenix or Lewis is a mile west. And Lewis just has like this horrible reputation. And I knew it sucked from the beginning because when you go there, it's a parking lot, you go through a Sally port and then it's six different units, but you have to take a trolley to get there. Now they knocked it down and you could just drive there. So like you have to get to work 45 minutes early just to get to your post on time and you don't get paid for it. Hmm. So I go there and instead of just showing up, you have to go, when you go to the Sally port, there's a sergeant there. He's like, who the hell are you? I'm like, I'm from Phoenix doing all this. I'm like, go to rest. I'm like, where's rest? Where do I get the key set from? He's like, just figure it out. I was like, okay. Try to figure it out. Like I'm on the clock anyway, so I don't care. So I go to rest. I say to the sergeant who I've never seen before in my life. I'm like, what do you want me to do? He's like, you ever been to Rining? I'm like, yeah. He's like, it's the same setup. I'm like, okay, cool. So it's buildings that are just square little buildings. And then there's two stories and there's a door in the middle, you know, whatever. Um, he's like, it's just like rest, but these are all PC inmates. I'm like, oh, that's not like rest. Then rest is IHP. People think you go to a PC yard, you're safer. You go to a PC yard, it's 
everybody's snitching everybody and it's it's all kosher and everybody's happy here and it's like no really like you go here and it's like okay instead of it being black whites mexicans whatever now it's like this white guy snitched on this white guy over a drug deal that happened with this guy's sister 10 years ago it's like every man for the fucking selves right it's a disaster and this is the one like you you I don't know if you've ever seen it, but there's like this whole news article about the cells at this facility because they weren't the doors that slammed shut. They were the ones that had the magnets that slid open. Mm -hmm. And the inmates knew that if you put something on the magnet and it would keep cycling and eventually die out, so they could just shimmy the door open all the time. Like you literally can see videos on YouTube of guys just opening their cells and just running anywhere they want. Um, I was working with another officer and I was like, is this your unit? He's like, nah, dude, I'm from Yuma. I'm like, Yuma? Yuma is the only prison in Arizona where you can't get any overtime because they're fully staffed. It's like on the border. So right. it's fully staffed. Like you go down there and they're speaking Spanish on radio traffic. It's like, eh, whatever. I'm like, so how are you from Yuma? He's like, yeah, I work six to two at Yuma. I take a bus, uh, not a bus, I'm sorry, a van pool at three o'clock that gets to Lewis at 530. So it's two and a half hours. I work for three hours and then I take another van two and a half hours back to go home because I have to go back to Yuma the next day and go to work. So like I get paid for eight hours. I'm only doing three hours of work because I'm here for three hours. The guy that relieved me later on was from Red Rock, a CO4 from Red Rock, which is like a lieutenant, but you chose the admin route. But Red Rock is two and a half hours the other way. And they're like, yeah, it's so short staffed here that people from all over the state have to come work here they had to do one 12 hour day there instead of like a eight hour day at the normal unit. Like that's how bad it was with the staffing. So I'm with the guy from Yuma. We go to the chow hall and these guys, you know, I wasn't in the fed, but you know, you take your sunglasses off, you take your hat off in the chow hall. Right. At least where I was, that's, that's where, where I, when I, at central, that's how it was. SMU, you feed in house. So it's a little different, but that's like the rule. I'm like, uh, okay. So I'm standing by the door. I'm like, nobody has their, hat off. Nobody has their cell phone off. I see a guy, shit you not. They might, I don't know any, they might recognize me from somewhere else, but I can't tell who the fuck you guys are. You're yeah, all wearing yeah. orange. You know, I don't, you're, you know, I don't know who any of you are. I see a guy sitting like this on his phone <laughs> and I'm looking at the guy and I had my hat, my sunglasses on too. So I was kind of the asshole, but who cares? Arizona's pretty sunny. This is an inmate. This is an inmate in the chow hall. And I'm thinking, I never want to come back to this fucking place again. The only other thing I knew about this place is the guy cut his own nuts off. So the guy's on his phone looking dead at me, bro, like, like this. He sees me over there looking, I'm like, okay. The guy that I'm with from Yuma, he's like, let's go over there and take I'm like, bro, if you go down that fucking aisle, you're going to get both of us killed. Just stand there. You're going to walk through the chow hall, the aisles in the chow hall, and go up to an inmate and tell him what he should or shouldn't be doing with every other inmate watching him, you're going to get both of us killed. Just stay over here. Somebody else brought it in for him anyway. Right. He sees me talking to the other guy about it. So his, his, his like, bro, you, you're caught. You're caught. So all he does is just turn around and face the other way and use the phone. All right. I'm like, okay. Chow's over. Go back into the building. You know, it's, it's people want to cover their doors, but it's like, all right, at least around count time, take the cover off your door. Right. Or at least don't cover the door directly. Cover like just your bed. Right. You know, it's just like we can see, like, okay, there's nobody dead on the floor. We could see your foot, your foot moving around if you're watching TV. But you walk around, I'm like, I don't understand how anybody can work here when it's, it's like, it's like, like you said, it's like you're, you're, you're cool at, an inmate is okay at one yard, but you go to another yard that has a different reputation. It's mm -hmm. just a fucking disaster. And I would hear these guys talk about Lewis that went to the Phoenix yard and they're like, Nobody starts at the Phoenix yard because it's so easy. It's like, you got to pay your dues almost and, and work at a different yard and come here. So like, let me just, you know, see what it's about, see what it's like, blah, blah, blah. But it's like, if the guy that I'm working with is from Yuma and the guy that relieved me is from Red Rock, who actually works here? Right. Nobody. Like it's that bad. Like the staffing was that bad. I know every prison short staff and, and, and every department short staff and all that stuff. But I was like, I'm not going to subject myself to this. And, 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 and I would hear people say like, I want to go back to RAS, the RAS Max, or I want to go only like, like the guy, the, the guy with the toilet paper is like, I want to go back to RAS Max. I'm like, why Cottrell? Why do you want to go back to RAS Max? I never understood that. Like the, the higher the custody, the more you're in your cell, the more these guys like it. Yeah. Well, I mean, in, in the feds, and I'm pretty sure this is how it is in the state is that 
that, first of all, the COs, you get away with more. In the lower yards. It, in, no, I was saying in the, oh, high, no, no, I'm sorry, in the I'm high. In the high lower right. yards, you get away with more because the guards are like, they're like. Picking their battles. Yeah, the, exactly. Like, do I, like, this guy's got a life fucking sentence. You know, he could pop off any time. Anything could go wrong. These guys, you know, they, they've. They don't have a lot to lose, so that the COs are, are a lot more one, you know, respectable, mm-hmm. or you're sp- respectful, sorry, respectable, respectful to everybody, and two, they let you get away with more because they're like the guy's never leaving here. It's like, don't die, don't kill your cellie, right. Like, right. right? And then as it goes lower and lower, by the time they get to a camp, they're talking to everybody like they're just dogs, you know, because you, that, and that's where a lot of the guard, the guards that are undisciplined or, and have behavior problems themselves end up in the low secure or in the camps and the lows because they know he can talk to these guys like anything. They won't, they won't do anything to him. Cause they don't want to get moved from there. They don't want to go back to a medium or a pen. Mm-hmm. You, you attack a guard. That's a bot. That's a bad, yeah, that's a bad issue. Um, but even that, like, you know, you're not, like I said, I tell people the, the only way, the easiest way to get through working in any prison is keep your word and just be able to talk shit. Don't take shots at people. Mm-hmm. Don't call somebody a punk. Don't call somebody a bitch. That's all we do all day long is talk shit. That's how we communicate. If I if I walk in my run every day and somebody's fuck you, Tamale, fuck you, and then one day he's like, what's up? Good morning. I'm like, Suspect. Like, what's right. going on here? But you're you're right. It's like you pick your battles in the higher yards. It's like, I know that if if I have a problem with this guy, okay, you're just intentionally being an asshole. I'm gonna talk to the other black guy that's in charge of this pile. Like, yo, can you shut your fucking boy up? Right, because if I have to start coming in here and, and sell search somebody, you know, I'll, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'm going to have to do my job. Right, right. You're gonna, everybody's going to be a very, very. It's going to get very, very uncomfortable for everybody. Right now, everybody's comfortable. They've got what they want. They're happy. Let's keep it that way. Guys are are, are, are writing kites to people, or, or to, you know, he he owes me two coffees. He owes me. He he took he took a, a he he didn't pay for a soap. Uh uh uh. uh what's it called? Uh. Uh, when they carve soap, like origami or whatever, not origami, like carve soap into a statue. He didn't pay me. He owes me $3. I'm like, you charge $3 for that? Soap costs $2, but like, that's the type of stuff you see at the low cuts. It's like, I don't understand why, like what, it's, it, I guess it's just like a culture thing. You have to act like the, like the guys in the club, like this club where in Brooklyn we have to act this way. I was like, I right, mean, you guys want to make it harder on yourself, go ahead. But, you know, it, I think about the, you see some of these guys and like you, you hear some of these stories like, all right, some of these guys are just complete fucking monsters. Mm-hmm. Some of these guys, you, you deserve to be here. But you look at a lot of these guys and it's just like, nobody ever loved you. Like right. you didn't have a parent. You didn't have a, a mom that was, she was strung out or she was tricking or got doing, your dad was in jail and you, you know, you were, you were just dead. You were, you were, you were destined for this. So back at SMU, it's like a lot of things just become like, as you know, like, like the story you say about the guy that had the heart attack yeah, and he dropped dead. And you're like, all right, we're all about to be locked down. Let me just over his butt, go get some coffee and come back. Yeah. Like that's normal. It becomes normal in prison. So I'm at SMU one time and a lot of people didn't like doing constant watches. Every once in a while it was okay because the way that unit was set up, you are walking up and down stairs all fucking day. You're, you're walking 10, 12 miles a shift. 150 flight. It's just the way it's set up because it's so short staffed. So every once in a while, like I'll do a constant watch. Plus, whatever for whatever reason, it was a uh, constant was it? watches. You just have to watch the guy. It's like a suicide hours. watch, right? Yeah. You know, at, at Coleman, they have the inmates do it. I I heard you talk about that with Zach. Mm-hmm. I'm like, yeah, a trustee or whatever. Like they yeah, would yeah. not have that. And yeah, you get a, you have to go to a little class. You take a, do a little. It's a little. You get a little certificate, and then they and they pay you for it. That's like, like the guy, the guy much, that I had said, the the one that taught me how to make the toilet paper. I was like, I can't just sit here and ignore the guy. Like right. it's just, he, his brain doesn't operate like that. But, um, so I was sitting on a concert watch at my unit at SMU and I didn't even know this guy. So, and a lot of those guys that were in, um, pod one, no, wing one dog. They were guys that just got shipped in from other units. So I'm sitting on my inmate. He's not talking. He's fine. He's just not talking. The inmate next to him, I'm, you, you know how this goes. Like if you're getting transferred from one unit to another, you don't have any of your shit. Mm-hmm. You're just stuck in a cell waiting. So like the only person you have to talk to is a CO. I think this guy realized like, all right, this guy's like, I'm doing, you didn't do anything to wrong me. I'm going to treat you normally. You didn't, you have not done a single thing to me yet. I don't care what you did to get here. He's like talking about stuff. And he was telling me about Winslow, like this, this, you know, I've never been to, but he was telling me about that. And, um, 
Mind you, I'm st- I'm responsible for the guy next to him on watch. Right. So it's a 12 hour shift, and we're like five hours into it. It's like almost midnight, and I'm like, all right, everything's going smooth so far. He gets up to take a piss, and the inmate says to me, so nonchalant, like, hey, you mind if I cover the door? I'm like, Ellis, don't do that, bro. Right. Like, look, Ellis. <clears throat> Please, like, just please don't do it. Like, I'm not yelling at the guy, like, what am I going to do? Open the trap and yank. Oh, fuck cares. Right. Like, just don't do it. He does it anyway. And he, like, like another one, just straight to, there was no speaking. It was, it was cold to boiling hot. I looked him up afterwards, and he had gotten into a fight with his girlfriend's dad or something, beat him up, and then he tied him behind the back of his truck and dragged him on the highway until he died. Jesus. You know, it's, and he only got like 15 years for it too, but it's just like, <clears throat> okay, now I understand. It's like you, you, you went to uh, zero to a hundred and then you just, you just lost it. Right. I didn't know that inmate. Like I said, that was the first time I ever seen him. And the same with the guy next to him, but the guy next to him wasn't on watch. He was just there because he was waiting to get moved around for whatever he did at another yard. So it's around midnight and he starts acting up. And I was not one of those ones. Like if a guy starts banging his head, I'm like, look, I think you're just going to bang your head. I think that somebody's going to call ICS right away. It's like, nah, you, you, let's, let me get some blood. Let me see. Let me see that forehead turn a little red. Like, let me see if you're really about it. Right. So this guy starts banging his head and, and flipping out and doing all this. So I have to call, you know, ICS. Everybody comes and reports. Open the trap. We spray him. Spray them again. It's like you can't just spray somebody 10, 12 different times to think it's going to magnify the effect. Right. It doesn't. They bring in the fogger. They fog them. We have to go get, you know, some of the available riot gear, which is next to nothing. We put it on, and my lieutenant's like, Tadaldi, uh, there's a bunch of other guys. Because I was the one that was on the watch to begin with, but a couple other guys, like everybody else, because everybody else, if you're on camera, you have to do a supplemental report, and the LT doesn't want to do that. So like, we have to go in and get them. I'm like, all right, dude, we just hose this whole cell down. This whole pod stinks like gas and the OC spray and the, the fogger and all that shit. We go in, we get them out, put them in the restraint chair. I have probably had five minutes of training on a restraint chair. And if it's 10 people fighting for the same thing, it's like, okay, you put your seatbelt in this thing I was supposed to put in. Right. So like this chair is not even, <clears throat> we're not, it's not even set up right. We take, we take the guy to a uh, medical, decontaminate him, just leave him under the, the, the thing in the chair running. He's screaming at the top of his lungs. Nurses come. They give him some type of shot, whatever they did. We put him back in his cell. We do the same exact thing 20 minutes later. Spray him, fight him again. I don't know what the fuck set this guy off again. We literally had to do the same exact thing twice. Well, I mean, the shot didn't do anything. The shot didn't do anything. I don't know what it was, but he started acting up again. We had to go in there and take him out again. This this cell is still grimy from before. He's still wearing the 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 the, the smock from before. We still have it all over us. We had to do it all over again. After this whole run, the guy kind of calms down finally. So by now it's like five in the morning. Because he's in medical for a while. Like, they're doing his blood pressure, and they're, like, you got these nurses. They have to, like, call a doctor. They, like, they can't make decisions on their own. Right. So the guy finally calms down. I catch up on my journal. I do my report, and it's shift change. And I start hearing, like, you could see through the skylights. The sun was coming up. I was like, all right, shift change. It's about to be 6 o'clock. The guy in the cell next to him, it's 6 in the morning. He comes to the door. He's like, good morning, Tadaldi. How was your night? I completely forgot this fucking guy was even there. Right. And I was like, he my, my, co- all that? my coworker was like, like, what the fuck? I said, like, bro, where were you? You didn't hear. We're looking at him like, you're just playing us, right? And he's like, what do you, what? I'm like, you haven't noticed anything since you went to sleep. You have not noticed any, th- th- nothing sparked your attention. Bro, I can't even sleep in my bed at night. My phone can light up and it wakes me up. Right. And this dude is sleeping through banging and kicking all the other inmates are kicking all this shit. And he's like, dude, I've been in prison for 30 years. I could sleep to the end of the world. I'm like, that bothered me for probably like two weeks. I'm like, you, how does one, how do you sleep through that? Yeah. I think the you spray, it's one thing at the noise. The second is the vibration of the doors on the ship, but the spray, the, this, the, that I'm like, and you could tell him like, this dude wasn't lying. He didn't notice because if he would have noticed 
he would have at least come to the door or whatever he would right. like to do. But I'm like, you, we spray, we gas all, like five whole canisters and it's all right next to you. I remember. So they used to give us two, they gave you like, you got like two sheets and two blankets. Scratchies. And the blankets, I would wrap up one of the blankets, you know, in like a, it, so you wrap it. So there was about this long, right? And it was, so it was about this thick. And then I would lay on my pillow and the blanket and I would wrap it around my head mm. so I could, it drowned it out everything. And then I would go to sleep. Listen, you'd have to wake me up. You'd have to go and shake me to wake me up. But until I kind of figured out that contraption, I couldn't sleep at all because all night long it's yelling and screaming and people moving around and banging. And yeah, so I had to figure something out. You know, and it's like I, when I would go to like, um, you know, the chomo yards, are, they're called, at least down there, they're called cooking meadows. Right. So there were chomos and where I was, they were just like, I don't know, behavioral stuff or whatever. But you go to cooking meadows, those are um, buildings and then oh, it's like two long hallways, but they're just double stacks of bunk beds on both sides. All It's like a hundred guys in each, you know, sides, so probably like two, four, it's probably like 800 people in one building. Jesus. And I'm looking and there's no cameras in there and I'm looking around and I'm like, you know, these are chomos, but first of all, I, I like this. Arizona does this. They, uh, <laughs> let's say you go, you go down for GP stuff, armed robbery, aggravated assault, whatever. Can't pay your debts. You know, shit happens. They move you. Right. Can't handle it there. They move you. And I was like, dude, now you have to PC up. Right. If you go to PC, I think as you know, like if you sign out, you don't get to sign back in. Right. So if you go PC, you're done forever. And then you can leave and come back in 10 years. You're still PC because someone's still going to know you. So if you can't cut it in PC, guess where they send you? What? Chomo yards. Okay. So you see a lot of GP guys in Chomo yards. You see guys on like, and they have to what? And they basically it's like you're gonna do it, do your time here or in the shoe. That's it. And you got guys, and, and they they try to run the politics <clears throat> like it's gonna like it's gonna be a, a GP. Or I'm like, dude, you know damn well. First of all. If you had this mentality, why didn't you try to just play along with the games when you were at Central or right. when you were at Kaibab or at Mori and all this shit? You, you're trying to run GP politics in a chomo yard, but you just go down these long hallways and you turn around and it's like you literally have to pass 200 bunks just to go back to where civilization is. And it's like, it goes back to what I'm saying. Like guys get booty snatched in there and turned out and it's like nobody – from the time the door opens all the way over there, it's like three minutes till I get back there. Right. Plus some asshole is going to stop me to, to distract me for some reason. Right. It's like, that's why people are like, yeah, people get away with stuff. It's like the, like, like the Jeffrey Epstein thing. There is no way that you take Jeffrey Epstein, you put him in that cell. He's going to kill himself. He doesn't know how to be an inmate. He doesn't know how to rip a shirt and make a noose. And he doesn't know how to be an inmate. Like that's like acquired knowledge as you progress through that. I don't want to say career, but it's like, he knows how to, be rich and do shit on the street, but he doesn't know how to be an inmate. He wouldn't know how to how to make soups and and stack milk cartons and put it under the, the metal table to to use it as like a stove almost. You know, it's just like he wouldn't know how to fish stuff. Right. It's like I think he was healing like the oh the cameras weren't working. Yeah, I'm pretty sure they weren't. I can tell you majority of the cameras where I've worked don't work. Right. They just sit there and it'll just say user error or whatever. And it's like you can put in an IR about it and then it's just gonna get thrown out with the rest of them. It's like they're not – it's just – it's 24 hours, dude. There's always something going on. You can't get this shit fixed. The turnover rate is so high. It's like I almost felt bad for some of these guys. It's like, you know, these, this dude right here is just trying to do right for himself. He's trying to figure he, – he's been down for 10 years. He has five left. He's trying to get it together. Right. He can't get it together because he doesn't get to do what he wants to do because there's nobody that fucking works here because they don't want to pay people enough to work here, so they just get by on the skeleton crew. And that happens in all these prisons, I'm, I'm sure, across in, in, in the country and in America. And, you know, you can't expect to be in that line of work and then not take shit home with you. Like, you can't just see some guy like, yeah, I just cut my nuts off and then go home. Like, it's not going to bother you eventually. I can say it's never bothered me, but I also was able to just turn it off. Just like when I would leave the club, like <laughs> I would leave the club at like five in the morning and at 10 in the morning, I was working in a restaurant talking to you know, good morning, Mrs. Whatever you want your side of meatballs or what, you know, right. you go from one extreme to the other. You know, I, I even had a guy and like, people think like, you know, when they say like 98% of the prison population is getting out. First of all, that's slanted because you could be getting out in 80 years. You're right. not getting out. I had a guy never bothered me. Never, ever bothered me. Didn't want to talk. That's, that's fine, bro. You do whatever you want to do. Cause you're not bothering me either. You I don't bother you. You don't bother me. Whatever. 
I catch him tattooing one day. Did you pay for the whole tattoo already? I was talking, you pay the whole tattoo? He's like, yeah, bro, I already paid it. I, like, I was talking to the guy, the one that never bought like, How much time you got left, dude? Like, you're down for what, aggravated assault? He's like, yeah, I'm six, I'm six in on a 10, and I, I'm up for parole in eight months. And I'm like, all right, I've known you for a couple of years. You've never bothered me. I'm like, look, I took the motor out of the gun. I kept, kept the motor. I was like, you guys deal with it. I'm not going to write. I don't even know how to write you up. Right. I care. I'm like, don't die. Don't assault an officer. Like, I'm doing the job as best I can. I'm, I don't care about petty shit. I don't see the guy after two weeks. So I'm thinking, or maybe he is getting pro, whatever it was. He gets, he gets rolled up somewhere. So two months after that, I'm leaving my apartment and I hear somebody say, what's up to And I'm like, no, 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 no. I have a first name. I'm in the real world. I have my DOC pants yeah. on, but not my shirt. Yeah. I'm like, what the fuck? I have a real, like, first of all, nobody even knows my last name here. This is just my fucking neighbors. And I look over. And it's the same guy with the tattoo, <laughs> crushing a 40, smoking a blunt. He's like, we're good, bro. You don't got to worry about nothing. And he moved in two doors down from me. And before <laughs> that, I had had words with those, not really words, but they had uh, little kids. And like, look, I don't care if your kids are outside all night long running around, but the only thing, can you please tell them to leave the little matchbox cars in your, it hurts to step on a fucking matchbox yeah. car. Everybody's done that. It hurts. We didn't have like a good dialect, not a bad dialect, but he was like, don't worry about nothing, bro. Everything's good over here. And I'm like, man, this could have been a little bit different if I would have yeah. busted your balls about that uh, that tattoo gun. But it's like, look, these people, are, these guys are going to come home and like everybody talks about prison reform and this and that. It's it's a lot bigger than just, right. it's a lot bigger than just, you know, I completed my GED program in, in, uh, in, while I was down. I said, look, I went to high school. I got a... I learned about the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria. Who the fuck has a job learning about that shit? Right. And and I feel like I hear I hear so many stories about the feds. Guys, like I I'll do ten years in the feds over five in state. Like there's so many of this, there's all this, these programs. I'm like Arizona, these fools don't got nothing. Yeah. Like yeah. these guys are these guys are like look in Colorado. Like this one guy's like in Colorado, if you do three years with no tickets, you get a year off your sentence. I'm like oh, that's a pretty good deal, you know. And it, it's just like, well, the feds, the, the time of the feds now is even better because. Um, the uh, is it first chance act or second chance act? I forget what they call it, but like it's like the something that uh, Trump signed into, yeah. which is saying, "Hey, if you guys program, we'll let you out early." So it's funny now all the all of the ACE the uh, continuing education courses, right? Oh, I'm sorry, adult adult continuing education courses. All of those classes are full. Everybody's signing up. Everybody wants to get a certificate. It's like Every what you said about the RDAP class. Everybody was like, "Bro, I, I'm, I got to finish this class. I got to finish this class. I got people that count me." It's like, yeah, now that now that you actually have a chance of getting out, now it really matters. Yeah, yeah. Where before it's like it, it's funny because like like with RDAP, like if you have a gun charge, you can't get RDAP. If you have if you have anything violent, violent you yeah. can't get it. So it's like. Well, that doesn't really help these guys. Like, you know, like it doesn't, it shouldn't matter. Like give them, give them the year off if they complete the program. Trust me, it's not, it's not, even if you're faking it, it you're going to learn something. Yeah. But, um, and, and now if you're taking, um, like the amount of time that these guys, like for the time I would have gotten, I would have done with the new program, I'd have done like seven years instead of 13. It's a long time. Right. It's, it is a long time. And you're supposed to still be until what, 30? 30. That's my out date. It was 2030. I, I can't like, you, I would see a lot of guys like, that's crazy to think about. Like I said, bro, I can go in there for 12 hours. I'm like, this 12 hours took, dude, it would get to the point where I was like, cause I remember I used to get not burnt out with overtime because uh, when I first moved to Arizona, I, I knew my friend that became a cop, but he was with his wife and kids and was, he's doing his own thing. I'm like, I just moved here. I got to figure out what I'm, I'm doing. I got to work. I was working a lot of overtime and you can do 32 hours a week of overtime. That's the max. So, you so up I used 72, 72 hours. Because at the time, like now I'm engaged. Right. My fiance wasn't living there at the time. We met when she was there for a weekend, but she moved there, you know, after that. But I was like, all right, I want to, I don't have anything else to do. I'm not really good at hanging around doing nothing. So I would just max out my overtime. And then I remember one time my girlfriend was in town. I would like take off the week that she was there. I was like, hey, baby, you want to, she's my girlfriend at the time, she's fiance. And I was like, hey, baby, you want to go get some chow? Chow. Fuck. <laughs> I do that a lot. I do that all the time. I was like, God damn it. I need to cut back. I'm like. I'm getting institutional. I'm like, God damn it. Listen, we do that. Uh, you know, um, but you, so, you, 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 and everybody, like you at least know the, the whole lingo together. Like you use that lingo together. Right. But like Jess, um, 
So my wife took RDAP. And so there's terms in RDAP that you would use. And she would say, um, she'll say, what was it? I'll say something, I'm telling you this and this and this is gonna happen. And she'll go, that's super optimism. And I'm like, don't, don't. She goes, I'm just saying, you're, you're, you're being super you're optimistic. Struggling with you're, accountability exactly, right now. Exactly, you're struggling. Yeah, and we, she used to do that all, she didn't really do it anymore, but first year or so when we both got out and we were seeing each other, she used to do it all the time. It would crack me up. She'd say, um, you're suffering for, for, wait, she'd go, you're holding resentment. That's the problem. And I, <laughs> stop it. <laughs> yeah. I, and it's like, it's like I said before, it's like, I, there's times I felt like such an asshole. It's like, I remember sitting on a constant watch. You couldn't bring books in. You can't bring a hardcover book. It might be whatever. I'm like, look, dude, I'm going to bring a book in. I'm sitting on a constant watch, reading a book about solitary confinement. I'm like, I need to go play video games or something. Like, I need right. to, but it's like this, this whole, like I said, the whole psychology of industry, because I don't know how you could put somebody in that environment and then think like, oh, everybody says the same thing. Like I got out and it just went too fast. And, you know, these guys that take these medications that they're like, okay, you get them at six, you get your noon meds, you get your evening meds. We give you a two week supply when you get out. They either try to sell it for money or they take it all right away to get high. And then they're right back two right. months later because they, they went off the deep end again. You don't even know who they are anymore. Yeah. yeah I, saw, I saw a guy when I was at Phoenix, he, this little fucking manipulator, he, he, uh, he wanted to go to the other side, the open yard. He somehow convinced his celly to hang himself because his celly was low functioning. And he did it in the porter closet and then he got moved to the open yard. So they rewarded him. They rewarded him for saving his celly. No, they rewarded him for his celly dying. And they, they figured, they were like, he's the culprit, let's get him out of here. So he doesn't teach everybody else to do it. So they moved him to the other yard. Wow. You know, it's like, it's a good line of work to be in. Like I think like it is recession proof and, and that paycheck's always gonna clear and it's just that, but you have to have a certain level of compassion when you go to this environment and you see like I tell my fiance this all the time, like, you know, and you don't know what this vibe is like the way him and I do, but not all perverts look like perverts. Oh yeah. Dude, you could see guys that I'm just that look just like you, bro, that look normal as fuck. It's like you did what? Like not all perverts are they're like short little bald fat guys with the beady eyes and the chumbo three thousands. Like a lot of these guys are just so normal looking. Uh, listen, I my ex wife came to see me one time and uh we were in visitation and she's like, What's that guy here for? I'm like, bank robbery. She's like, what, what, what about that guy? And I go, I think he ran a Ponzi scheme. And she's, what about that guy? I go, drugs. That guy, drugs. She goes, what about that guy over there? And I go, oh, you're not going to believe this. And and That's the one. Yeah. And, and she goes, what? I said, sex offender. And she went, no. Okay. What do you mean? I said, yeah. I said, like, he was, like, he would, I said, and he's actually, like, hands-on. Like, he actually went and found like a 13, 14 year old girl, like was having sex with her. I said, pictures on his phone, the whole thing. And she went, but he's so good looking. Like she was so, she, <laughs> I was I like, do. anyway, tall, good looking guy. Uh -huh. And I was like, yeah, I said, he's a, he's what we call a sleeper. Like he's, he wouldn't you know, know. You know, he wouldn't you, know. If he didn't have to provide paperwork, he could have lied about some other shit and made it up. He actually did, cause he actually did lie for a long period of time until somebody eventually outed him. And it was another guy, a friend of mine named Turk. Turk was not, not really Turk, he's Turkish. But anyway, um, uh, Turk was in RDAP with him. And he's like, this guy was super hard on the shows. Like he was overly. He's trying to like make it seem like you're the yeah, you're scum, scum of the scum. You're this. It's like he really was pushing it. He said, I just felt like something was wrong. He said, well, you're an RDAP, right? So guys like tell on each other, right? That's like the, you call the people up, like about the salt in the kitchen. It's like you brought salt into the kitchen. Then you, you have like that, what was the thing you said? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I was yeah. listening to that one yesterday. I was like, yeah. this fucking guy's crying over salt. That's probably, that's only at a low yard. So so we're sitting there. Um, oh, I'm sorry. We're, so Turk was in in uh, was uh, in the RDAP program with him. And so something had happened where... And Turk was like, like I knew, so I've always felt like something was up. But what happened was the guy had done something. I don't know what it was. He hadn't, he, he did something, you know, something minor. But when he came by Turk's cell, Turk, he said, hey, man, Turk, what's going on? He said, hey, bro. He said, um, he's like, like they know. Uh, and he goes, what? He said, I mean, I, I don't care. Like, I'm not going to say nothing, but it's getting around, like. 
And it's people. As know. soon as one person knows, everybody right. knows. And he went, and this guy thought they're talking about how he had maybe smuggled some chicken out of the chow hall. Like, like it was something like a few people knew, but he's like, it's getting around and it's going to catch up with you. I'm just letting you know, everybody's, they, it's getting around. And he was like, fuck. But what he thought, so that's what Turk is talking about that. But what this guy thought was, they know I'm a chow. So he's like, does so-and-so know? Like was, which was his like best friend. Right. And he's like, no, but he said, if, if he doesn't know now, he's going to know within a couple of, he said within, he's going to know by tomorrow morning because tomorrow morning is the, the, um, is the, uh, the morning meeting and somebody's going to call him up <laughs> or something along the, you know, so he's like, he's going to know by tomorrow. And he's like, fuck. So he's still, Turk's talking about the chicken. This guy goes, and I don't know that it was Please chicken, don't tell me he added something. himself. He goes straight to his fucking celly and outs himself. He's like, bro, you don't, listen, I want to just talk to you before you hear this. This is what's going on. This is what, and he said he just lays it all out. I, I, I mean, I knew she, look, I knew she was underage. But how how know, long did he go from, from? Oh, he'd the, gone like two, he got like three years or something, right? Like, wow. Like he didn't, he somehow or another, he got prosecuted for the photos, but not the chick that he actually, whatever. Yeah. Um, and he ended up in the Fed, right? The Feds pick up the case, the 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 state never prosecuted, or he got charged with both. So here's what always kills me: you can get caught with like like a thousand photos or something of underage kids, right? In horrific acts, and get three years in, in a in a federal prison. In the state, you can actually get a hold of someone. You can ha- be caught having sex with like a 15 year old girl or whatever, and you're 25 or whatever. Um, or thir- 45 and you're having sex with a 14 year old or 13 and end up getting two or three years or probation. It's like mm-hmm. photos in the fed three years. That's a, that's a, a mandatory minimum state. You might get probation for actually getting your hands on, on somebody like, so, so that's what, so he, he was doing like state and federal time at the same time or something like that, but he's in the feds. So anyway, he goes, he outs himself. And I mean, he just, and when did he realize like, yeah, I just added the wrong thing. Uh, I, I think <laughs> it's, I think it's some, I don't know if at some point he ever figured out that Turk was like telling him something because Turk, Turk knew something was up. And, and he said, so I said that he's like, and I, I was specifically, you know, I, I went out of my way not to be specific because I wanted him to think that he said, but I didn't know it would blow up the way it did. Like, I, I just thought he would try and he get. He said, I, I don't know. I said, I, I didn't know what was going to happen. But anyway, so that was the guy that I'm sitting in there with uh, my ex-wife, talking to my ex-wife. And she's like, him? I'm like, yeah, listen to this. So I tell her the whole thing. Boom, boom, boom. And here's what's funny about that guy. That guy leaves prison. First of all, he had uh, like a, a, a girlfriend or wife that was coming to see him all the time. She also looked very young. Now, she was probably 22 or 23, but she- Yeah, but if, they, if, if she, she was 17, they wouldn't have let her in. Right, no, I know that. But I'm saying if, if, she, if she had told you I'm 15 years old, you'd believe her. Yeah. She's 22, but she looks young. I got it. So he's engaged to her, married, I'm not sure. But what happens is he ends up, gets out, gets out. I mean, this is how long I'm there. He gets out of prison, and then two years later, he comes walking in the fucking door. He violated probation. What happened was they violated his probation because he had an email address that he didn't tell them about. And somehow or another, they checked his phone. They found it. But then once he was there, he got reindicted. Like they did that to get him off the street. Mm-hmm. He they Then like a year or so later, he's now thinking, okay, I'm about to get out, go back on probation. They indict him. He was actually communicating with some girl. And- <sighs> She had sent him photos or whatever. So it's like he had a compulsion that he couldn't, you know. And when you talk to these guys, you know, like a criminal knows a criminal, right? You talk mm-hmm. to him and you realize, like, you're not a criminal. You're just a pervert. Like, you're just a weirdo. You, you can you can be dealing – I could be dealing with a death row guy, the most violent, dangerous person in the world. And if if you are respectable to me and I, and I have shown it's like, I'm, he does my job. He doesn't treat us like derelicts. We're already in here. Their job is to not repunish us. You can have a good rapport, All right. but you can look at a, he's not wrong at a pervert and you can be telling them you're going to get life in prison. You're going to get butt fucked by Neanderthal. All of a sudden he's like, he's just thinking like, 
Man, that girl is so cute. Like it's like, dude, am yeah. I speaking? Am I speaking gibberish to you? What's going on right now? Yeah, there's not. There's something. It's a lights off, dude. And I t- I tell my fiance and, and I tell my nieces as I look as I get older, like not all perverts look like perverts, right? Like if you see a guy that's like he has scars all over his face, wearing a red bandana, and he has tattoos everywhere. It's like, all right, dude, you're you're just trapping doing what you have to do. But you can just see somebody. It's like that guy, right? The Wall Street guy, the the the, the white collar guy. Or the guy, what was the guy? Mike Walsh talks about the banker. He's like an ex- invest in the investment banker that he had to. He hires Mike Walsh, which is a an attorney, and has Mike Walsh fly to Vietnam to find three under a or three Cambodian prostitutes that this guy Knows. is being charged with. The, the government saying they're underage. He's saying they're not underage. So Mike Walsh has to go. He spends like a month there tracking them down, gets some visas, brings them back to the United States to explain, to, to show the government, look, boom, and they drop the charges. Now, when I was funny, when Mike Walsh was telling me a story, I was like, I was like, oh, okay. I was like, oh, okay. So he was, uh, oh, okay. So you got him off. He's like, yeah, he got off on that. And I said, "Oh, so he was he was he was innocent." They were he's like, "Oh no, no, no. They they found a couple thousand photos on his on his uh, you know, on his computer." Like, no, no. He was he got, innocent of that. Yeah, though. He was he guilty was, of everything. He else. Goes, he got like 20 years. But but on my stuff, I got him off. Like, you know, that's he's I a lawyer. Job. That's all he cares. I did my job to the fullest. But yeah, like it's like you're an investment banker with tons of money and you're doing this. What are you doing? You're, you're there's something just deeply fundamentally wrong, but I don't know. And it, it just goes back to like the whole like system in general, it's like, you know, I don't have, you, you have kids or like, I don't have kids. It's like, like if you don't give these kids love in the beginning, it's like, fuck, they're just at a disadvantage. Like I, I just think that I don't have kids, but you know, what's like, what does somebody do? Like, what can you be forg- forgiven for? You know, it's like the, the child shit. It's like, I, I know guys that have like 350 year sentence. It's like, all right, obviously you're just had the worst lawyer because your stuff is run not concurrent, it was consecutive for you to have a 350 year sentence. It's just like, where did that switch go off in your head where you thought, this is what I wanted to do? And then you got these guys that are just these predators in prison and they prey on these young guys and it's, you know, it sucks. You can go in at 18 and have two years and your your fucking whole life's fucked up on the way out. Hey, I appreciate you guys watching. Do me a favor and hit the subscribe button, hit the bell so you get notified of videos just like this. Also, please consider joining my Patreon check in the description box. I've got a list of books there and I really, really appreciate you guys watching. See ya.